would like to call the meeting to order. Um, is Diane um, with us tonight? To, no, she's uh, not. I will be right. Diane tonight. Okay. All right. Great. So will you do a roll call then? Yes. Karen? Here. Carolyn? Mute. You're muted, Carolyn. That's okay. Yeah. I can see her. That'll okay. count. Becky? Here. Diane? Yes. Umer is not here yet. Uh, Patty is not here yet. I was just talking with her as well and sent her another link. So hopefully she can get in. Linda. Here. Okay. There's Patty. There's Patty. All right, Patty, you've just been counted by the roll. And we're moving to the next item, which is saying the Pledge of Allegiance. So, uh, and there's Umer. So, um, if you would like to now stand, we will say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation and under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, great. Um, good to see everyone that uh, is here so far. And um, thank you all for making this special meeting uh, about our uh, roof project. And um, I imagine you've all <coughs> received this very big packet of information or looked at it online that has been prepared. And I hope you had a chance to look over it a little bit ahead of time. And you probably have noticed that there is a report uh, by BEC, Building Envelope, uh, Envelope Consultants, it's at the front of the packet. Uh, then we have some presentation, uh, some submissions by solar consultants after that. Uh, and then I think the very last pages of the packet were created by you, Greg, uh, beginning on page 139. Uh, and that's a chart or a summary of possible rough actions. Greg, is that right? That's correct. Okay, fine. All right, so um, there's a lot of material to look at here, obviously, and um, I think the first thing that we want to do is uh, hear from our consultants, uh, BEC. Um, does anyone have any preliminary remarks, or um, should we just get started? I, I would uh, just... Go ahead. Um, My so, name... <clears throat> Sorry. All right. Well, we'd like to uh, welcome our guest here tonight. Um, I see uh, David uh, Bellastrari. Am I saying your name right? Yes. Okay. And um, let's see. Brad, I, I'm not sure I have your last name. Uh, it's Chelowa. C is an H O L E W A. Okay. All right. So um, why don't you each tell us uh, your role? and um, what type of uh, questions you might be able to address this evening. Well, let me uh, kick, kick this off. I'm the president of Building Envelope Consultants and the, the lead on the team. Um, uh, my, my team uh, includes uh, Brett Chelwa, who is, was our team lead during the inspection site visit. Um, and Andy Barriento is our Director of Business Development, uh, who has been the point contact for the project going forward. So that's why the three of us are here today. Um, wait, I don't think I see Andy. Did you say Andy's with you? A uh, Andy's there. I see his name, but I don't there see his Andy Barriento, okay. A uh, Andy, do you want to unmute at least? Say hello. <laughs> He may be having technical difficulties, I'm not sure. Okay. But he's he is there, I'm sure he's, I'm sure. <laughs> He'll come on. Well, why don't you just go ahead if, if you had any preliminary remarks? Well, I mean, in summary, uh, regarding the assessment of your roof, um, the biggest takeaway I thought from it uh, there were two. Uh, the first one being that uh, overall uh, the roof assembly is dry. Um, it has a couple of locations that are wet uh, due to uh, some specific conditions that we can discuss. Uh, however, it's not conforming with 
the design of the building, which is uh, peculiar to say the least. Um, so you have some significant energy sinks as a consequence of not enough insulation. Um, and it's just non-conforming with the building design as we uh, compare what we found to what the building plans uh, show, should be there. Uh, and so ultimately that, those are our biggest that, What does that mean when you say it's not conforming to the building design? What does that mean? Um, I, while I'm talking to you, I'm going to be kind of looking at uh, our, our report a little bit. And um, uh, after the narrative uh, of the report is the building plan uh, overview. Um, that would be typically, that would be found on page 16 of 67 on our report. And at the bottom left hand corner, of that first page of the building plans that we submitted is the comparative insulation, um, which is again, like I said, the biggest takeaway is the section of the roof does not include the full amount of insulation and in some instances includes more insulation than what is in the design documents that you have for your facility. Um, and and so what I mean to say that it's it's it's, it's non-conforming, it just means that we're finding different sections of material than what was in the design documents that were provided to us. Now, those design documents may not be as built. And so there's a, when a, a new building uh, addition is uh, designed, uh, there is the, the original design intent. And then there are a number of changes that are made along the way, whereby at the end of the project, a new set of plans are submitted to the owner known as as built and and those include the changes during the course of construction so the design documents that we looked at were the, the pre-construction documents not post-construction documents so there may be other stuff we didn't see or maybe it just doesn't exist i'm not sure but i can tell you that the documents that we reviewed have a number of disparities in terms of the insulation thickness than what we discovered. Hmm. Uh, Greg, did you, uh, no do you have any questions? Or, I mean, do you have any information as to where the, the as-built design documents are by any chance? And Omer, I see you have a question. I'll get to you in just a second. Yeah, we provided, um, we provided all of the plans that we had access to um to uh, you know to BEC as well as to uh, anybody else that we've been uh, talking to about the roof in one way or another so you know if there's a separate set of plans that are you know uh, as built um, I'm not aware of them uh, other than you know what we you know what we already sent you guys okay also um, just so you know we also did uh, field testing of the thickness of the material on all sections of the roof right did that along with David I think and uh, so we have a pretty good grasp of what is actually there um, and David do you want to elaborate on that? I, I just want to say that all projects do not come with a set of as builds okay. uh, really it, it's 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 I would say maybe more uncommon than common but I, I, I just wanted to make that you know uh, point um, and Andy's right, and the only way we were able to determine this is because we cored each one of the roof areas um, and the locations of our cores are shown on the first building plan following the narrative of our report as pink circles on the plan. And so those are the locations we took our cores. The findings of the roof assembly are shown in the uh, summary page of the narrative, which would be page, pages, excuse me, um, 13 and 14. And um, that's the, the little charts that we have there that give you the profile. And of course, that section of our narrative is also supported by the photographs. Uh, we did take photographs of each of the cores showing you uh, the, the, the cross sections of the roof assembly. <clears throat> Um, 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure your page numbers are matching up to what I'm seeing here. Uh, I'm, I'm using uh, a PDF uh, reader, Acrobat reader. I'm, I'm looking at it, and that's what I'm doing. So if you're looking at a printed copy, then you would be looking at uh, pages 12 and 13. Actually, those sheets are not numbered for some reason. Yeah, the uh, photographs are numbered uh, that uh, in the report as well. Oh, why are those pages not numbered? So between pages 11 and 12 are two pages that's a chart titled Niles Main Public, or excuse me, District Library. And you can see there's a chart. It's uh, in a landscape format. Do you see that? It is page 14 and 15. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, good, good. Okay, yep, in the PDF uh, reader, you'll see that as 14 and 15, yep. yep. Okay. So then the, the, the photo section of our report that follows the roof diagrams uh, showing where we did find moisture, uh, I wanna talk maybe a little bit about the roof diagrams. Those red circles with arrows correspond with the photo number uh, in the photo section at the end. So if you are looking at, for example, the final roof diagram, RP6, you'll see that in the lower right-hand corner of that roof diagram, RP6, is number 78 with an arrow pointing to an item on the diagram. And if you scroll down in the photo narrative to photo number 78, that is what you are looking at uh, that corresponds. So. <clears throat> uh, Omer, you had your hand up. Did, did you want to ask something before we go further? And if so, you need to unmute yourself. There. Um, David, I had uh, one quick question for you. So you mentioned that the roof condition currently is not in accordance with what the spec diagram show correct is that am I understanding that correctly that the original there's, there's a mismatch between what the roof condition actually is and what the original drawings for the roof uh, suggest it should be correct okay uh, so is that oh, oh, um, wait whoa whoa whoa, whoa. That sure. wait wait I'm sorry I, I like Brett Brett yeah, it's not the condition, it's the insulation bed thickness yeah. is what yeah. varies. So the condition is not described within the building plans, it's the thickness of insulation above roof deck okay. that, is, that there's a discrepancy. So, so in other words, it should be this thick here, or it should be this thick here instead it's this thick, etc. Yes, or now, vice versa. How, and vice versa, okay. Um, and how common is that? Like, is that, I mean, are we one in a hundred or does that happen quite frequently? Well, <laughs> quite honestly, uh, the majority of the projects that we get involved in, we're lucky to have any building plans to compare what we find. So in fact, uh, the building plans that you had, in, in my opinion, were very valuable there and they were very helpful. Okay. But when we do have building plans to compare what we discover on site, most of the time, they're pretty close. Okay, and, okay, so most of the time they're pretty close, but that's only of the times that you actually have plans. So right, and if, and if you ask me how many times that is, I'm sorry, I could, just, I could not give you a number, I apologize. Ballpark half or ballpark, you know, one in five? Uh, it would be unfair of me to even speculate on that. Okay. Fair enough. So Carolyn has her hand up. Yes, Carolyn. Hi, I have a question. I, I noticed in your documentation that you did indicate the differences in the, um, the thickness of the insulation. My question is, is there any significant problem with it being at just the way it is? I mean, I, it's obviously not what they intended it to be. Some places are a little less, some a little more, but What's the significant effect that it's causing? Well, the number one uh, uh, difference would be your energy use. Um, the less insulation that you have to resist heat loss, uh, the more your 
energy costs are going to be. Right, I'm aware of that concept, but I'm saying for the discrepancies you noticed, is the difference in energy that significant that it matters? It's been like this for years. Uh, I mean, to what degree are we losing energy that you mentioned this? We, our, our, the per, our scope did not include energy analysis, so I, there's no way I could even come close to answering so then we that don't even. So then we're not even addressing that problem, correct? Well, we're more concerned about the right. We're not we're, we're not addressing energy analysis except to say that two things. One is is the current energy code requires an R value insulation thickness to achieve uh, a resistance factor of thirty. Thirty. Right. Um, there are some areas of your facility that have an R value of six, which is well beyond even at the time the building was constructed. Uh, or well lower than uh, it should have been. Um, so, what percentage so, of our roof would you say is too low? What? Well, any areas that are below R30, not meeting the current energy code, would be too low. Now, we did not retroactively go back to determine what the energy code requirement was at the time the building was constructed, no, except no, to I, say that, uh, except to say that you know, roof area R uh, four, roof area four with only an R value of 6.5 is, uh, you know, egregiously below where it should be. Um, but having said that, if you're asking for a per square foot roof area or per square foot or percentage of your roof area that is not in conformance with today's building code or question. energy or energy code, the answer would be everything but roof area three, which is still slightly below the R30 minimum, but um, I think could be considered acceptable by the building official. Okay, but the rest are, is all below where it should be. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah, and so our uh, roof area three represents, um, let's see, about a quarter of your roof. So about three quarters of your roof does not meet the current energy code. Okay, all right. So um, uh, Patty, you have a question and, and just let me say something. Um, I don't know if you had you know, some more general comments to make before we start asking questions, but Patty, <laughs> why don't you ask your question and then, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry if we've sort of derailed whatever presentation you might have had by our questions, but Patty, why don't you go ahead and then we'll come back. Can I can I just interrupt for one second? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I can wait. I, I, I can just wait. I, I just want to let you know we don't have any formal presentation for you today. We presented the report to you. Uh, I'm sure you've all you know read through it and have questions. We just want to answer your questions and help you understand what it is that you have. So you don't feel like we, you're interrupting our presentation because oh, you're not. Okay. Okay. okay right. Then I do have a question. Mm -hmm. You said the only area of the roof <coughs> that is just about up to code with the insulation is area three, but area three is also one of the areas where you stated there's moisture. Correct. So there needs, there should be some repair work done there, according to what I figure. Uh, same with area four was the other area that you said there was some moisture? Uh, correct, yes. Yeah. R3 and R4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so R4 is the one with the real low insulation anyway, so if we have to repair it, hopefully it gets up to code. I'm concerned... Well, it will change the R value of the material. When, when, when roof insulation gets wet, in, in fact, it even loses what R value it may have had. Right. So, I understand. Yeah. yeah, we know. I, what I'm saying is, since you said our roof four is at, at six. Good point. Good point. If we have to replace it anyway, that should bring it up. They When it's replaced, they should bring it up to R30, right? Yes. Because that's the current code. My concern <laughs> is you're saying the roof three is already at R30, but it has moisture. So like you're saying, 
it's not technically at R30 anyway because of the moisture affects that. How much of the roof is actually with the moisture? Right. right. Um, so the the, um, the difference between what you, I mean, we, you could bring up that roof area to code if you're going to do a complete re removal and replacement of that roof area. Um, the areas that were actually containing moisture are relatively small in comparison to the whole roof area. So if you're going to do a spot repair in the areas that contain moisture, it's specifically around the chimney and roof area three, and around the one roof area, the the roof drain around roof area four. It's a pretty small area. So the only way that you could achieve um, energy compliance or, you know, to code compliance would be to do the complete roof areas that had, you know, limited moisture saturation within that, within the insulation bed. Wait, Fred, say that again. The last thing that you said, it, I'm getting a lot of feedback. What did you say? Right. So I, I think the difference in what Patty is describing is that she's, if just because those roof areas do contain moisture, she's and preferring that the whole roof area would be replaced in its entirety, although the areas that contain moisture are relatively small in compared to the right. full area that right. is contained within those, so roof area three and four. Okay. So, so the repair does not require the roof area to be brought up to building code in its entirety exactly. from a technical standpoint is what Brett's saying. Thank you. That one roof. Okay. So in, in what he's, you're basically you're saying with area with the roof three, if we just repair that one small section and make it dry, you know, get rid of the moisture, then bring that up to code. But I'm still considering roof four. I mean, that that is from what I look at a pretty small roof. Do you have any idea what <laughs> I'm just asking? I'm not saying Carolyn to replace it. I'm just asking, <coughs> what would it cost to replace that roof four, which you say has got the lowest amount of insulation? Um, I think we uh, estimated the per square foot costs for removing the roof to the roof deck um at uh hold on I'm, I'm reading through this just to try to find that number um i think we estimated at 22 dollars and 50 cents per square foot uh however the dollar values that we were figuring were based on a single mobilization for the entire facility and so any economies of scale that may be gained would, would, would potentially be lost by doing one roof, but I, I, it's not like it doubles the number. Um, let me just see where we're at here. So 2250 um, times Can you the tell us what page, what page you're on? Sure. Uh, so we're in the better, good, better, best section, and that would be found on page... Um, Four, and that's 3.07, paragraph 3.07. Wait, I'm sorry, what page are you on? What four. Was page, page four. Uh, <laughs> if you're looking at the PDF, it's page five. <laughs> page five. All right, so you know we have two page numbers on each page. Uh, one well, page, oh it's page my. six, and it's page six um, in our numbering system. It's page four uh, in the lower right hand corner. Uh, I think you're better off if you try to follow the, along with the paragraph numbers. Yeah, and three okay. point uh, find three dot oh seven. Okay, uh, is what he's referring to. Yeah. Um, All right. Um, may I make a, a request? Um, just on a technical <laughs> yeah. note, if everyone who is not speaking could mute themselves, we're getting a lot of feedback, and the recording is going to be horrible, really hard for people to understand. So, if everybody could please do that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Andy. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot better. You know, maybe, um, you know, maybe if we could start um, with the uh, three potential recommendations, David, and you could walk through what those recommendations are and what they would involve. And, and then we could start 
you know, uh, you could start fielding questions and, and specifics. Uh, maybe that would be uh, maybe that would be a good approach. Well, uh, from the report narrative, um, 3.05 is our minimum recommendation or good. 3.06 is our medium recommendation or better. And 3.07 is our best recommendation. Um, and our minimum recommendations are to perform the, the, the maintenance to remove wet insulation um, and refurbish roof, roof area seams. Um, now, when you re the, excuse me, when you replace the insulation, you only need to replace to the thickness that's there. You don't need to, uh, there's not an obligation to bring it up to R30 if it's like at R6. Uh, you are correct. As, as the one roof is. So um, in those areas specifically, which are, uh, which are small by comparison, you would take it down to the roof deck, replace the insulation to match the insulation elsewhere on the roof that is dry, and then you would put a membrane patch over it, correct? Yep, absolutely. Um, and then everywhere else on the roof, um, you would uh, do some work on the uh, on the seams to make sure that it's watertight. Is that correct? You are correct. Okay. That's right. That's right. And and the uh, um, and the estimated price for the um, for the minimum recommendation for for the good recommendation of three point oh five is one hundred and forty three thousand dollars. Correct. That is what we we believe to be yes. Okay. So I mean we're not trying to tie you to anything here uh, as much as um, Use these numbers as an order of magnitude uh, yes. that we, ex you know, we expect in a competitive bidding situation. If you were going and by single mobilization, you mean do everything at one time, one fell swoop instead of trying to stage it or anything like that. So uh, attacking the the roof with this plan in mind should bid out at about one hundred and forty three thousand dollars. That's um, my expectation. Yes. Okay. Now, one of the things that you um, that you mentioned in your report, and I, I don't have a site on it, um, one of the things you mentioned in your report is that we have a uh, structure on the east roof um, that has some chimneys and yes. and has um, uh, it's the top of the elevator shaft. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's in poor repair. Um, and your recommendation, I believe, is since um, we're no longer using the elevator, instead of repairing this thing, which is intended to service you know, the, uh, the elevator, we should consider removing it, correct? Yes. And the price to remove is not anywhere in this number. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Do you have an estimate uh, for that number? Uh, uh, not at this point. I'm going to let Andy answer that one. Yes, what we what we're going to do is that obviously we can give you an estimate on on the opening and and redecking it and putting new insulation in uh, to match the existing, you know, with a membrane. But uh, the tricky part of this is in the demolition. In other words, taking the wall down, and um, we're going to. Uh, work with a contractor to come up with a, a, a close estimate for that type of demolition work. Mm -hmm. So we should have a number for you very shortly uh, of the demolition work in addition to, to recovering that opening uh, once that area is exposed. Okay. Very short, there, early next week, yeah. And there are a couple of, there are a couple of, uh, um, flues, chimneys that are housed in that structure. So, you know, uh, you know, if we take out, you know, if we take out the entire structure, we would still need to figure out how to service whatever those chimneys are servicing, correct? Yes, I mean, certainly that, that's true. Um, and they would be handled simply or just as a, any other penetration, any other beat type uh, HVAC exhaust vent, hot stack vent, uh, it's it can be certainly handled. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I know you know um, all we have really are Brett's observations, and you guys have read the report. Is there a ballpark? I mean, are we looking at you know ten thousand or 
50,000 or 30,000 or, you know, more or less, or, you know, I mean, is, is there something, um, you know, an approximation uh, that we, we're, I'm, I'm looking for an order of magnitude, yeah. basically, because, you know, you tell me you're going to take start part of the structure down and it's sounds big. Um, I, and, and I, I, I want to be able to give you something that's real. Um, and un until we're able to determine how far down the chimney stack needs to come below the roof deck and yeah, okay. exactly how we're going to frame that roof deck back in, um, I, you know, it, it would, it would be wrong for me to give you a number that you, you know, would, would, would be real, uh, sitting here right now. And that's why Andy's enlisted the services of a, of a Mason contractor to help us to get to a, a real number. Mm -hmm. um, we, I do have one of our structural engineers looking at the plans where the elevator shaft is shown uh, to help provide some guidance on that, um, but we weren't able to uh, pull that together at this point, um, and, and it really wasn't part of the, our lead up uh, for the roof cover condition assessment thing. That, that actually, that part of the, our, our program that, you know, our part of our contract would be uh, uh, put in the design side. Mm -hmm. uh, of the phase of our work um, as opposed to the assessment. Okay. So, but we can, we will work to get you a number. Okay, great. So in, um, uh, it would be fair to say that whether you're looking at uh, 305, 306, or 307, um, that, that number would be an add-on to each one of those cases, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And there would be no difference in the way that the, um, you know, there would be no difference in, in the way that that chimney would be treated or that structure would be treated, um, you know, that's dependent on uh, each, uh, either of the three cases, correct? Um, no. Um, if we leave the, so the numbers that we have in there are leaving the chimney in place, or excuse me, the elevator shaft in place. Mm -hmm. So the elevator shaft would still be flashed. Um, in a similar way uh, that it's flashed now, only it would be, you know, better. It would be more robust. It would not be allowing water to enter the, 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 the roof assembly as it is currently. I see. So, so if you left the elevator shaft in place, you can do that. But our recommendation is if it's abandoned, um, it's definitely one of those weak links in any roof topography. So if we can avoid it and get rid of it, that's the best thing you can do. It's simply stated, holes in the roof are bad. Correct. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. I noticed that a few people have had their, their hands up. If you were done, Greg, uh, I'd like to move on. I think I see several, but I think, Diane, you had your hand up first. Diane, you have to unmute yourself, and then you can ask a question. Okay. This might sound like a stupid question, but does this mean we won't have an elevator in the building? No. Uh, that elevator has been, uh, we have. <laughs> that, we have these have, this has nothing to do with the elevator we use, is that no, it? No, no. Okay. Uh, there are actually uh, two elevators, uh, two ele elevator shafts in the building. The one that we're talking about in, um, on the uh, eastern end of the building, the far mm -hmm. eastern end, uh, has been uh, abandoned for years, uh, for numerous okay. years. Okay. All right, feel better. All right. So, so the one that's so the one in the lobby will continue to work to serve all, all the floors. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is um, this first uh, one hundred and forty three thousand just to do repairs, necessary repairs. You also mentioned it's only a five year warranty, uh, you know, approximately. Uh, that's not very long uh, there's not a there's no warranty whatsoever it's just a repair oh, right and and i think oh, it's an estimate of it's a well, it's, what does it say it's an extension of five years it to the estimated five. life estimated life five years only okay right yeah that's not very long i don't think yeah. okay uh, are we done, Dan? I'll move. I'll yes, move. yes, All right. for now. Okay, Becky, you had your hands up a couple times. Carolyn, I see you. I'll call you next. Thank Becky? you. Yes. Hi. So my first question was also about 
which elevator we were talking about. Um, so the elevator that we're talking about has not been in use for a long time. Right. The east side of the building is the oldest side of the building. Is that right? Right, right. Okay. It's, and, so, uh, and, 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 it, and it doesn't even face the public. It's, uh, you know, it, it goes down into the, uh, the basement and up through, um, uh, up through uh, the maintenance and IT areas. Okay, and so that is just empty space. It's not doing anything at the moment. Yeah, it um, it, it was abandoned in place. You know, so in other words, you know, uh, as I I believe what we did was uh, just basically covered the entries. Um, probably uh, we drained all the hydraulic fluid out of there and just left everything um, in place. Is that something that needs to be addressed in the future as well then? Getting rid of that? Not necessarily. Um, you know, if you wanted to reclaim the space, I mean, obviously that would, you know, be a way to do it um, uh -huh. you know, think about it. But, you know, at the moment, I mean, if it's about the size of an elevator car, maybe a little bit bigger, uh, okay. if you can imagine that. And I think it's uh, on uh, two floors. Okay. And then uh, back to the the 305 paragraph. I thought it said it was going to be, uh, in our opinion, these actions will extend the existing service life to at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why, why I don't see the five here. Uh, the five is in the last line of the paragraph. Okay. So the last line of the paragraph says that it will um, right. An extension uh, of five extend years. it by five. And uh, uh, the earlier in the paragraph, it says, you know, it would make it a, a, a 10 year uh, yeah. solution. So a lot of the, uh, it like, looks like half the roof has about five years and half the roof has about 10 years of life left in it. Is that correct? Uh, about, you could okay. say that. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all my questions for now, thank okay. you. Uh, Becky, Carolyn, I'm just gonna ask a real quick question so we can all look at this while you're asking your question. Uh, it looks to me, I was looking for a photo of this elevator I think the only one, the best one, would be photo 47. So uh, while Carolyn's asking her question, you can tell me if there's a better view of it, but I think that's the best. So Carolyn, why don't you go ahead with your question? Okay, um, again, my question is under your good recommendation. Um, I was of the impression that the good recommendation would cover all the repairs you noticed, there was debris in, near some spouts, there were seams that were cracked, and um, there was wet insulation. So I know you mentioned quite a few things. So I thought that's what you meant by um, when it says you'll replace insulation and refurbish seams. So all those little areas that were problematic will be covered under this. You'll clean the debris as well. Well, uh, 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 I mean, keep in mind, uh, Carolyn, that I mean, we're, we don't do the work, right? We're not the contractor performing the work. We're, we're designing it. We're, we're doing the condition assessment right, and the design. This. Right, right, exactly. But you wrote so, this, so I'm trying to ascertain under good, it means all those minor repairs that were noted will be covered. Yes. I'm correct. Okay, but then I had another question. You said, alternate to this approach that um, the entire roof surface would be uh, to coat the entire roof surface coating compatible to roof membrane. An alternate to what? Not doing the repairs and just coating the entire roof? What does um, that mean? No, an, an alternate to treating the seams specifically. Okay. So you would do the entire roof rather than just specific seams that you mentioned were problematic. So the, the, the seam work includes stripping in the seams with new material. The, the coating application is a liquid applied, I guess, I guess the easiest way to, to, to describe it is like the painting, painting the roof. Right, right, I'm aware. Yeah, I understand the process. I'm trying to figure out what, the, what, we're, what we're excluding. So you would not do the you're, seams and you would just coat the roof? The things that you exclude with the a good uh, option is enhancing your heat loss by adding insulation. Um, it is by uh, 
uh, I guess, not adopting a full system warranty period of, you know, 20 to 30 years, if that is something you wanted to do. And it's also, I guess, uh, it does not include, you know, holistically bringing your roof into a single, a single reference point, uh, I for better, lack of a better term. Okay, so under the good recommendation, you would repair all the minor damage or issues that you noted in your report. We, we wouldn't do it, but they would be addressed, yes. Well, whoever you're hiring. Oh, am I, did I get disconnected? Oh, uh, what was, who, who had that question? Who, who had that question? Carolyn? I think Carolyn was asking a question. I think maybe I I think she's frozen. Somebody asked, is, is, uh, is, is, assuming that. There, there are two processes here. Let, let me try to say exact uh, words and I'm trying to under. Can you hear me? No. I yeah, can hear I can, you. Yeah. yeah. Let me just simplify it. So if you go in, you repair the seams, that, that, that's one procedure. If you coat the entire areas after they've been, the seams have been corrected, sealed, let's say, that's another process. Okay, so, so one doesn't have necessarily anything to do with the other. There are two processes, and if you coat the roof, you can get a little bit more longevity out of the system. Um, and, and of course, the primary thing is that if you do a repair, you have to make sure that all the seams are sealed. Because if you just coat the roof and you don't do the seams, you can still have issues. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, perhaps we can go on to, uh, yes, uh, Brett. Um, so back to your question regarding the elevator shaft um, overviews. If we look at photos 37 and 38, that is the same elevator shaft, um, the masonry uh, in question that's depicted in 47. So 37 and 38, 37 shows it on the right hand side in the foreground, 38. It's on the left-hand side, um, and that's the same chimney that's depicted in 47. A little bit further distant views of them. Okay. It, it's the brick structure that stands that stands up from the roof. Okay, great. Um, but she was just asking if there was additional photos of it. Yeah, so thank you, just so we could, you know, visually see what we're talking about here. Um, okay, great. We've discussed the good approach a little bit now. Uh, perhaps we could have a discussion about the better or the next approach that you have here. And uh, did you want to say, start off by saying a few words about it or should we launch into questions or Greg, do you want to say something? Yeah, let me, um, you know, maybe I can guide the conversation just a little bit. Great. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, just move to another spot. I'm going to stay on, but I'm hoping to get a better connection. So just okay. keep going. Okay. So, uh, uh, David, uh, did we lose you? Oh, there you are. Okay. I'm here. Okay. Um, people are moving around on the screen. I don't know why. Um, but uh, to go on to the better recommendation, uh, basically what, um, what the project definition for the better case would be uh, to take the membrane off completely, all of the roofs, uh, all 40,000 or so square feet, um, address those places that are wet with new insulation, and then bring the entire uh, building uh, insulation, our, our factor up to 30 as per the code, correct? Yes. Uh, and then uh, once that's done to reinstall uh, a brand new uh, membrane, uh, and along with that brand new membrane, we would be able to get uh, a warranty uh, let's say 20 or 25 years. And I think when we talked uh, about this before, uh, you told me that the warranty uh, length is determined primarily by the thickness of the membrane. Is that correct? That's correct, uh, Craig. And okay. uh, the thicker the membrane, the, the longer the warranty 
Okay. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, there's some membranes that, uh, for example, with EPDM, a 90 mil membrane, you can get a 30 year warranty uh, with a, a TPO membrane, which is a white membrane. If you do an 80, install an 80 mil membrane with the appropriate insulation underneath, you can get also get a 30 year warranty. Okay. So, so those warranties can be extended, and you're correct, based on the thickness of the membrane. Now, the labor is the same. Right. So the only cost is the thickness of the membrane. Okay. The additional cost. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and your, you know, your expectation is that to do what I just described under the better case would be about $600,000 or about $15 a square foot. Correct. Okay. All right, um, that's, all, that's all I have, uh, Karen. Okay, do we wanna go around maybe and see if there's any questions about the better suggestion? Anyone have any uh, questions about that? Yes, Becky. Becky yeah, just, in... just a little bit. Um, so I'm looking at, I think this is what you prepared, Greg, that if we did this option, uh, it would make it possible to install a ballast type of solar panel. Right. And I so, guess maybe this is going off topic, I don't know, but I was wondering what the difference when we move into the best situation allows us to do any kind of solar panel and in the better situation, we can only do the ballast kind and I don't know why that, what, what the difference is and why we can only do one in the middle. So, um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to save this for our conversation a little bit later, uh, primarily, but uh, I'll just give you a, a quick answer on that. Um, if, um, if we want to install the type of solar array that has to be tied into the uh, structure that's underneath the roof for uh, greater stability or, or whatever, um, then you have to dig down through the insulation and through the roof deck or maybe to the roof, roof deck, depending on the installation, uh, in order to secure that. Um, if you're going to do that, uh, it's best to strip all the insulation off and basically start from, you know, start from the roof deck. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you know, you put the ballast type of uh, installation on, which basically just sits on the roof. And um, the, the thing that these roof guys love is that it doesn't add any holes to the roof. Because every time you... Concrete every, blocks for holding it down, right? Yeah, pretty much. Those cinder blocks hold down the panels on the roof. It's just weight to prevent them from sailing away, right? Correct, correct. Okay. But we could talk more about that, you know, later on. Okay. Okay. All right. So we'll this is not a whole new roof. This is just... The last option is the whole roof, right? The this option is not a new roof. It's just new membrane. Right, okay. right. And adding additional insulation where the inst in, uh, insulation is too low. Okay. So Thank it's you. putting Great. insulation on top of the insulation that's already there, right? Right. Is that right? So, so in, in, in the better option, you're salvaging after you're removing the wet insulation, you're salvaging what insulation you have <clears throat> that's there that's in that's dry and then building up from there and then putting a new membrane on so that's the second option and then ultimately the the last option would be to install new insulation from the deck and put new membrane on you know so you've got a brand new assembly basically um, one of the things uh, one of the things that I asked and I can't remember if it was you David or you Andy I said, so you got old insulation, don't you want to replace it? And uh, you know, David's uh, smiling, so it must have been a conversation I had with you. Um, and what David uh, told me is that you lose a little bit of the effectiveness of insulation in the first couple of years, and then it stabilizes pretty much forever. So as long as the insulation stays dry, it'll be effective. And um, uh, and you could reuse it. Oh, so there, there's no justification for why you can't. Um, I I, I want to just back up one second on something you said about the solar panels, Greg. Just yeah. if you don't mind, real brief. Um, you're absolutely dead on. Exactly what you said is correct. The only thing that you want to be concerned about 
regarding the non-structural attachment and using the ballasted attachment as you add load to the roof. Right. So you, you do need to do a structural analysis to make sure that that method of fixing the panels to the roof is appropriate for the structure. That's right. I was just, I was gonna say. There's a significant amount of weight with these ballasted systems, significant. And if your structure has not been designed to accommodate that weight, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. Um, also, there, there, there are weight limitations, uh, obviously, for your structure. So you, when, when you're looking at installing panels as well, you know, that becomes a concern with adding all that extra weight. Mm -hmm. Right. So do you know uh, whether or not our roof is currently constructed could uh, sustain the additional weight of the panels and the ballast if we chose to go that direction? Uh, well, we, when, wouldn't, we wouldn't know the answer to that unless there was a structural analysis done. Um, the, your building is, uh, in my opinion, a very sound building. But a lot of buildings that we look at never initially were designed to accommodate the weight of ballast and or panels. So then you have to add additional structural supports to accommodate that extra weight. Maybe. And, Maybe. and, and that, on, on top of that, we, we, would, we don't know what kind of solar panels are being considered. So we have no idea what their, their load, combined load is, or the size of the array or any of that. So uh, we, we could get involved with the solar panel vendor to do the structural analysis once we have that information. Um, I mean, that's not a big deal. We, we, we can get that information for you. Uh, but that, that information needs to be obtained before you jump on it. That's, that's our whole right. point. The, the other thing about solar panels specific to the roof is you want to make sure that your roof system has a expected service life or warranty parameter that at the minimum meets your expected service life of the solar panels. Because you don't want to have a roof problem and then have to remove your solar panels and then go back on top. It, that, you, you don't want to do that. So if you're planning on solar panels and you know what roof areas you want to put on, you want to make sure those roof areas are well matched to the service life of the solar panels. It should actually exceed to some degree, the service life of the panels themselves. So please consider that. Okay. Any other questions on the better paragraph that we were just looking at? And if not, uh, we can go into the best paragraph. And uh, Greg, is there any, uh, anything else you want to say with respect to this option? Well, um, you know, just what we've said before, the best, um, you know, the best uh, case is to strip everything off of the roof and basically start from the roof deck and build up, which would mean uh, new insulation, new flashing, new membrane, um, you know, every, uh, every component would be, uh, would be replaced. And give you an opportunity to evaluate the condition of the roof deck itself. Um, because that's something that we can't do, even with the technologies that we brought to bear uh, and during our assessment. And that is always a, a, uh, something that we would encourage. Um, so our, our, best, our, our best plan for you, I mean, there, our, we, our numbers may be slightly off. I mean, it could come under the $900,000. But my point is, is for if you have monies monies budgeted to replace the roof and you have a roof that has the uh, variety of sections that that it does regardless of its moisture content um, and you have an ability to do this kind of process to bring it up into again a, a holistic system where everything is the same no matter what part of the roof you happen to be standing on, uh, we encourage our clients to do that. Uh, we offer better, good, better, best to, to give clients options based on their budgets. Um, and, 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 you know, good is, you know, we're trying to just achieve a couple of years so that our budgets can be met. Um, that, that's why I would encourage going down that road. 
Um, having the dry insulation obviously gives you peace of mind um, that you should be able to sleep at night and you're, you're, you're repairing the roof and you're maintaining it. But if you have a budget uh, to allow you to get right down to the deck and be able to inspect that and, and, and take care of everything seen and unseen today, that's what we encourage you to do, and that's why it's the best option. So, um, you know, I, I just uh, I just replaced a roof on a um, on a house, and it was a tear off. And when they tore it off, they inspected the uh, the decking, which is which is really what David is talking about. Um, and there were uh, several spots where the decking was uh, rotting and they had to tear that decking off and replace it in order you know hey the the wood as it was wouldn't even hold a nail so you know in order to you know have a sound product a sound end result you have to uh, you have to remediate that um, I, I believe David you told me that our roof deck is wooden is that correct that so, is correct so um, our roof deck across across the uh, breadth uh, of the building is wood, and by uh, pursuing the best option, we have an opportunity to take a look at it uh, very closely and uh, remediate the areas which were failing, and uh, you know, and and as I said, have a, a much better end product. That, that so, that's um, correct. I'm sorry. You, you mentioned you use a nuclear moisture meter uh, in part of your assessment. Can you tell, is that, that tells you how much moisture is there in the insulation, right? Um, is that what it does in part? Um, it, 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 what it does is it defines the concentration of hydrogen atoms that are present uh -huh. beneath the machine. And with uh, wa moisture water being two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, the idea is that the higher the concentration of hydrogen would represent more water uh, okay. presence in the roof assembly, yes. So my question is that that tells you if there's water in the insulation, right? That's, yep, and it's very will accurate. It, will it also tell you if there's any water in the wood underneath that insulation, which in my mind leads to rot? It, it can. It, it can if the wood itself is wet, because sometimes uh, wood will decay in, in a dry state. So you get what's referred to as dry rot, where it's been wet and it dries and then it's wet and then it dries. And so depending on what cycle that's at, you, you know, we can't say that the deck itself is being caught by the gauge. The gauge typically has a depth of measurement of about eight inches. So, I mean, that's, that's its effective depth for reading. And none of, your insulin, none of your roof assemblies exceed that, so we should be able to get to the deck. But that does not define that the deck is itself wet. I expect that the deck is wet and potentially rotted in the areas of, uh, that we found um, Moisture. To, be, to be wet. Yes, thank you. Um, so that, but we can't confirm that. So, you know, we don't know until we open it up. Let's, let's just say we do go with the option of ripping off all the installations so as to uh, inspect the deck surface. And let's say there is some rotten wood there. H how much does it cost to replace rotten wood decking? Is there a certain like square footage cost or, I, I mean, and I'm just wondering how much more might it cost if we find rotten wood there? It, it could be a nominal expense. It could be a more uh, uh, high expense. Um, I, I don't know how much rotted deck there is, if any, that needs to be replaced. But typically, on these kinds of projects, that is considered a unit cost item. So it's included in the contract that the roofing contractor that says, if we encounter rotten deck and we determine it needs to be replaced, this is the square foot cost it's going to be. Andy, what is it? What's typical these days for, for wood deck? Well, anywhere from uh, uh, 450 a square foot to 550 a square foot. In fact, I was on a project this morning, today, 
that we uh, are uh, re-roofing with a, a, a contractor and um, uh, we went down to the deck and uh, it, it, it's a roof that has this giant cooling unit on the roof. And this roof was leaking for years. And that deck was literally eaten through, uh, so much so that the guys that were tearing the roof off had, had to make sure that they were spread out. Otherwise, the concern was that somebody was going to fall through the building. So we had to patch that, those areas up. Uh, and it was, a, again, a metal deck, so we had to put um, a layer of sheet metal down over the deck and screw it to reinforce the deck. So um, there, there are other things involved, but no matter what the decking material is, if, if you've got leakage, whether it's metal or wood, uh, the deck's going to deteriorate, but the only way that you can really find it is with a complete tear-off, really. So, and, and then you can repair it. Uh, we're doing a project in California like that right now too, that's, that's wood, that's plywood. And the contractor, uh, before he goes in, um, is to find some areas were defined that he has to remediate. So he's gonna take the membrane off and then, and then remediate the deck as well. So. And, and even in that regard, <clears throat> we, know, we won't know until the roof is removed and the deck is exposed to really determine what needs to be removed and what doesn't, doesn't. Now, during the course of a project like yours or like the one in California, um, only the parts that would need to be replaced would be replaced. They're, they don't replace roof deck as a, you know, just because they want to replace roof deck. The roofing contractors would rather be in production to put the roof down than to become carpenters and replacing roof deck. There's not a lot of profit in roof deck replacement. Uh, their money is coming in the roof membrane and the insulation that they're putting down. So yeah, that, and that's before, kind of an aside. And before oh. the, 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 as the job bids, what we, what we do in our bidding documents is that we require a, a square foot price for the material so that you have an idea of what that cost is. And the variable then is how much how much material is damaged as we tear it off. You know, that's the variable. But you have a fixed cost as far as replacing it, you know, in the, in the, in the specification process and the bidding process. And, and so, it's all required to be documented. It's not like they're, they're just up there tearing off panels. They've got to take pictures of everything that they're saying that needs to be replaced unless there's, you know, full-time observation. But in lieu of that, they would have to document it and then verify that that's the case. Brett, you got a comment? Yeah, and I think one of the things as well with this is I don't think it'll be a significant amount based on the areas that were actually saturated. We're talking about a very small area, not very, but a smaller isolated area around that masonry chimney, and then a smaller isolated area around that, by, um, around that internal roof train. So we're, you know, we didn't find anything that was um, widespread as far as the water infiltration. So any deck requirement that would, or any replacement deck requirement due to water damage, I think would be a minimum, uh, a minimum area. Yeah, it's, it's, it's rare when there is significant amounts of roof deck, even with wood, that need to be replaced. So I don't want to give you guys any heartburn on your deck being wood and that it's got to be torn off or anything like that. But the other thing regarding better best is Sometimes with some roofing manufacturers, they, they will balk at putting their materials down over somebody else's materials and then giving you a full system warranty. Um, you, mean sometimes, like you mean like insulation over someone else's insulation? Is that what you mean? Correct. For example, I, I, I understand that the roof, uh, most of the roof areas on your building have a uh, system manufactured by, by Carlisle, which is a very good roofing manufacturer, excellent, excellent manufacturer. But <clears throat> if for example, our bid package came out and said, okay, Carlisle, Firestone and uh, Johns Manville are accepted manufacturers for you to bid this project. And Firestone came in and said, okay, here's our, here's our roof assembly per your design, uh, except we don't want to offer you the full system warranty we're only going to offer you the warranty for the stuff that goes down on the deck that's ours. That's it. 
So we're going to stop at that lower level of insulation. So sometimes they would do that. Uh, sometimes they won't. If we can show them, hey, we did a, a thorough assessment. The stuff is dry. There's nothing wrong with it. But some of these guys, you know, they, they have their agendas and they may not want to, to, to play nice. And so the only way to effectively get the, 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 the strongest, most robust warranty from the manufacturer is to take it down to the deck because then on top of knowing that all of the materials on the roof are their material, then the deck which supports their material has already is also being inspected during the course of the re-roof and they know that everything is fine. And, and, and so that's a little more part of the difference between better and best. It, it just kind of all flows downhill from a certain standpoint from the manufacturer to knowing that your facility is solid. Okay, all right, thank you. So I noticed it's about, well, it's actually a little after eight o'clock and I wanna leave time to talk about the uh, solar part of this uh, possible part of this project. Uh, but does anyone have any questions about just the general roofing uh, alone? Patty, I see your hand up. Yeah, my only question, <clears throat> because of what I've read in a couple of places in here about that uh, elevator shaft, and you said it, you are working on getting an idea of what that would cost to get rid of it from the roof so we can go over it. When do you think it would be possible to have that information? Because as far as I'm concerned, if we're doing this, we ought to figure that into, you know, like, okay, we're going to redo the roof, A, B, C, whatever we decide, we ought to figure what that's going to cost too. I'm hoping to have that by midweek next week. Okay. So to have a, a, a firm, you know, a, a, a very accurate number uh, that, that we can present. A, re you. a reliable number. Yeah. A reliable, yeah. Mm -hmm. So guys, um, uh, the board meets again uh, on, uh, on December 16th. Um, you know, same, basically the same time, same place, same channel. Uh, would you be able to have it uh, for the uh, for the board meeting at that point? December sixteenth. Um, hold on one moment, please. I, I can't imagine why we couldn't. But that's I, in I, six I, days from now. So December sixteenth is. Um, I know that's an important Four days. Day. Yeah, I would hope so. Is it 7 p.m.? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, great, great. And that would tell us how much it costs to remove it and plank over it and put the insulation and everything on top of it so as to, to complete that project. Now, did I hear something about there's some vents that go through that elevator that would still have to go to the outside? Did I hear that? I'm not there, sure. Uh, there are uh, chimney flues. Oh, okay. Okay. So you know they, uh, you know they'd have to replace it with something, in order to uh, in order to vent those gases to the outside. Okay. Uh, it it it's better to be able to flash a pipe penetration in a roof than it is a wall, especially a wall that's not newly constructed. Brett, go ahead. Yeah, and just to answer that question. If you look at photo thirty eight. Um, just in front of the chimney, you see that circular penetration. The ones that exhaust through the chimney that is um, being, you know, kind of slated to be removed would be the, in a similar fashion as that one that's visible just to the north side of that chimney face. So it looks similar to that. Okay. Just All to right. give you an idea. All right. Okay. Um, unless there's any other questions about the roof itself, let's move to the solar part of it. And we see uh, on our agenda, there's three different groups that have submitted some materials. I have to say, I was a little confused when I was looking at the last one, the circle design. It looked like there's other companies' materials in here too, uh, inserted in the middle. So I'm not really sure how that works. But uh, you want to just give us a general overview of what we're looking at here. And then maybe we can ask some particularized questions. I 
I think those are different, uh, a different panel of people. So uh, thank you very much. If that's the end of our, of our discussion, we'll plan on being back on the 16th and we'll get you the number for the, uh, uh, the lift, the elevator shaft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you guys. Thank you you okay, bet. Night. For your uh, detailed Bye. explanations. So Diane, Diane, you had your hand up? No, no, you're not. She's, she changed her mind. Okay. Shall I let the next uh, consultant in? Yes. Uh, and, well, yeah. and, and Andy, know, Andy I mean, you should sign out. There you go. Okay. Um, I didn't know if BEC did any evaluations of these solar companies. Did they do that? No, they didn't look at them. Um, you know, uh, uh, two, two of the companies are companies that they have experience with. Which two would that be? Uh, Patrick and uh, Circle. And is that good experience or bad experience or? <laughs> uh, good experience. Okay. All right. And um, okay. So who do we have uh, coming here this evening, Susan? Mike McTavish from Dewberry. Mick, what is his name, McTavish? Michael McTavish from Dewberry. Yeah, and I, and I just want to say uh, that uh, Mike came out about a year ago or so um, and did an initial uh, walk around. Um, uh, he's a referral from uh, Frederick Quinn. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, I became aware of uh, Mike's firm when uh, I was you know, driving around, they put up a new uh, complex uh, for the city of Countryside uh, in uh, near where I live, and it's a zero net building. Um, so it pays no energy costs whatsoever, uh, solar, uh, and has a water retention and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I found that to be very interesting. And they came out and they were up on the roof and walked around a bit and and uh, develop some uh, initial thoughts that uh, we talked about briefly at, at one meeting, um, but felt that, you know, that they were uh, worth a more serious look for, uh, for this product project. Okay, all right. Um, just in terms of time, Susan, do we have other guests coming uh, later? You do, you have two others to follow. Okay. And okay. we had told each one 15 minutes that they oh, have 15 good. minutes to present and ask questions, answer questions. All right, I see Mr. McTavish is joining us now. Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well, how are you? Good, good, and I understand you're from the Dewberry Company, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, I had one other person who's who's also attending, it's uh, Roger Beard, I think he oh. shows up as R. Beard. Um, okay. he, he was, directly involved with the countryside project so he'd be able to speak you know okay. very intimately in, in that project if you had any questions on that one All in right, particular see, uh, um, mr. apparently it's mr beard also um uh in our meeting now so okay. we do have uh your um uh, uh submission here um uh, your uh statement of interest uh, did, did you want to give us just like a little overview or uh, uh, if you would allow me to looking at here? I'm sorry, I'd be able to share a screen otherwise I could just give you a brief overview that. okay okay, okay now we, we do have your brochure too so right. if, if that doesn't work we can look at what we have uh, this is a something we put together to be geared directly for this this meeting so okay all right Great. okay so we should be seeing a Pictures of photovoltaic panels right now. Um, yeah, good evening, and uh, yes, thank you for allowing us to present our qualifications and talk uh, about your specific uh, potential solar project direct, uh, directly. Um, as, as mentioned, my name is Mike McTavish. I, I would be the project manager and electric engineer on this uh, particular project uh, throughout the whole duration of the project. Um, I'm also senior associate with Dewberry. Uh, we have Roger Beard on the call as well. Uh, he was an, he is an electrical designer in the firm. I'm out of the Elmhurst office. Roger's out of the Peoria office. And uh, we're also showing Nick Hardin, who is 
the head of our structural en engineering department for the Illinois business unit, and he would be performing any structural analysis on the existing roof structure to ensure that the added weight of the solar panels and and balance of system equipment would would not tax the roof structure. I'm, oh, so uh, just to clarify, so he actually looks at the structure of our roof yes. before any installation is done. Yes, because because we're adding um, right. weight to okay. the roof, and you know we have to count this along with snow load and all these other things to make sure that we're you know <laughs> not putting too much weight on the roof. Uh, so a, a brief agenda here. We'll talk about Dewberry, our experience, uh, your your potential project directly, and then have some time for questions in the end. Um, so we are a 60-plus-year-old uh, family-owned company. We have over you know 50 locations across the the United States. We have two offices in Illinois, Elmhurst and Peoria. We're uh, over 2,000 employees, uh, specific mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers. We have over 200 who have performed, you know, amongst our engineering offices. We've, we've done many different solar installations all, all across the, the country. Uh, we're experienced with uh, helping procure energy grants and rebates. Uh, we've, we've worked with Ameren and, and other utilities. And uh, just to speak to our size, uh, consulting specifying engineers has a, a list of their largest engineering, MEP engineering firms, that's mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and, and we're currently number 36 out, out of, you know, basically all the MEP companies in the United States. So our experience in solar, th this is the project that I, I had my first experience with solar power in. It's in Indianapolis, Indiana at the uh, MHA Bean Federal Center. It was part of the uh, Recovery Act and it was a uh, two megawatt roof mounted system. At the time it was installed, this was the, the largest roof mounted system in the United States. And of course, in, over the last 10 years, it's been passed over several times. But um, th this was interesting because it had a, uh, a solar lab uh, that Sandia National uh, Energy or Renewable Energy Labs put um, in to evaluate multiple types of solar panels against each other and not just talk about the um and just their overall array so that that was a very interesting project to be part of i'll uh, hand it over to roger to talk about countryside roger beard and i was the uh, principal uh, electrical engineer on the uh, countryside project and uh we combined uh, roof mounted and canopy mounted systems. Um, approximately two thirds of the uh, per PV production is off the canopies. Um, so we have a limited roof area, but we still have uh, roughly a hundred KW of uh, a roof mounted system on the building. Um, we have a power monitoring system that measures lighting, power, uh, HVAC and the PV. So we have a year's worth of data now. And uh, over the course of the past year, we've um, actually done 10% better, about 303 kW with the system. So it's performed really well over the course of the past year. And we uh, uh, went through the whole process with ComEd with the NAP metering and the uh, interconnect applications. So uh, there's approximately 466 canopy mounted panels and about 172 uh, roof mounted panels. Okay. Thanks, Roger. Um, Campbell Soup Company headquarters, both Roger and I had some involvement on this project. It's in Camden, New Jersey. Um, it, it's a large array, 4.4 megawatts, and it, it's, it's a combination of different technologies. Uh, you can see some roof mounted on the main facility, um, on this parking facility, and also these would be those uh, canopy PVs. Basically what it does is it provides a shade canopy over the parking while also generating uh, electric power. 
This is our most recent design. It has yet to go into construction, but it's in Champaign or um, it's in Urbana for the Champaign-Urbana Mass Transit District. Um, it's, it's a little different because it's being installed at the um, sanitary district property. And we are, we're taking the power, was it over a thousand feet to the mass transit district where they are installing a hydrogen production plant to power a uh, completely fuel cell uh, bus fleet. So their desire was to be uh, completely off the grid, 100% um, renewable with their bu bus fleet. And this uh, PV array is, is going to be the, the electrical source for the hydrogen production plant. And this is our smallest roof mount array that at least, you know, Roger and I have been involved with. It's at the Peoria Riverfront Museum, which is a, about a block away from, you know, Roger's office down there in Peoria. It's, it's only 30 kW and it's far from powering this entire museum, but it, it, it's installed. You can kind of see it on top of the planetarium roof. That's this cylindrical type structure here. And uh, it was used as part of a design to show how much power could be produced from photovoltaics. Uh, there's what they call a green screen uh, down in the library that shows facts about the, the array, how much power is produced, and also translates it into other metrics like trees planted or, or cars taken off the road just to, to show the impact that it's having um, on, a, a, on a sustainability scale. So. Uh, to talk about your your project specifically, uh, as Greg mentioned, um, back in February, we were actually out on site. We went on the roof. We looked in the main electrical room. Uh, we uh, evaluated the western flat roof areas of the library, uh, mainly because we had existing drawings to look at. Um, and our structural engineer said that in these magenta type areas, that the roof could handle an additional 30 pounds per square foot and the blue would be an additional 10 pounds per square foot um, of load on top of the roof beyond what the, the design safety factors would be. So what we would propose is to use those roof areas with a self-ballasted system. We, we think preliminary layout we could get about 288 you know, high efficiency, you know, monocrystalline, you know, kind of the best in the business panels on the roof. We'd want to use a self-ballasted racking system, which, which is this is what it would look like. It sits on top of the roof. You you don't have to anchor in through the roofing membrane, which is good. It, the less penetrations you have, the less opportunities you have mm -hmm. to leak. And um, we'd also put the inverters, which is this little cube shaped uh, device. What that does is it turns the DC power that the panels produce into AC power, which is what your building devices use. And we would try to locate the uh, interconnection into your building at the uh, main electrical room. This is a, just to add a comment, yeah. uh, the countryside picture shows uh, a nice view of the ballast, um, ballasted system. Right. Right, we can go back to that. Um, but this is the uh, a preliminary layout we did. It, it shows uh, shading in the, the darker kind of purple colors. The brighter the orange, the more direct sunlight it gets. Um, this area is kind of overflow in case our analysis shows we need to add some additional panels. Uh, th but with just using this portion of what we call the A roof and this portion of the B roof, we think we can get 128,600 kilowatt hours annually. That's on average. And you know, your initial estimate or the amount of load that you shared in the RFP was only 90,000 kilowatt hours. So we, we could even, you know, pair it back to try to try to match the solar power production versus the electrical demand that your, your facility has. And we would recommend net metering um, versus any other sort of interconnection. Um, all that does is it, it allows you to overproduce in the day and make up for the 
you know, obvious nighttime hours when your array is not making any power. And basically you, you pay the net in, in, in power that, that was not produced by the solar array that you had to take off of the grid. Oh, can I ask a quick question just before you move on from that? Sure. Uh, just to clarify, net metering, is that where you're connected to the grid? And you, the, the power companies are paying you if you're putting more in and charging you if you're taking it out? Is that what you're saying? And if, is there an alternative to that? I thought there was one. There are multiple alternatives to this. There and we went through through many iterations on our last project in Champaign Urbana. Um, net metering, you basically don't get paid for the excess you produce under this situation. You try to size your array to your demand and you you basically pay the net shortfall. If you overproduce, that gets credited to your next billing cycle. So in July, I'm obviously going to make a lot more power with my solar array because the sun's out longer than it is in December. So I'm going to be able to bank that additional power produced in the summertime to offset those winter months when I'm not. Now, there's other, pro, um, there's other ways to sell your power back. Part of it is through community solar where basically you're selling the power to other people and those other people are claiming credit for the power that you're producing. So say I lived in an apartment somewhere, but I still wanted to do my part for green energy. I could take part in one of these community solar programs and purchase the solar power from you. Or you could sell uh, solar renewable energy credits. And those are usually at a market rate and there's different markets you can go on. Um, and it's going to depend on uh, a lot of these are options that you'd have we'd have to discuss with ComEd um, as to how we do the interconnection, how it's metered, and how the system and the riders you have with ComEd are set up, which allow you to get into some of these other programs. Um, the problem with some of these other programs are I'm, if you're selling the solar renewable power to other individuals. Um, generally, you're the one that's entering into the contracts. There's not some other intermediary. Sometimes there are, sometimes there's not. There's, I guess there's a lot of different ways you can get an advantage from your photovoltaic array. It's just in our experience, Net metering is the easiest and cleanest because you're dealing directly with one person and that's the utility company to offset your electrical loads. Okay. I know it's, it's a lot there. <laughs> okay. Believe me, it, it is. It's a lot when you go through it and dig into it, um, uh, all the different ways you can, you can benefit from your, your array. Right. Hey, can you, can you tell us um, what the approximate cost uh, per kilowatt hour uh, for an installation is? Our most recent with a high efficiency panel of, you know, kind of what we're proposing here, Roger, is that around $3 per watt? I think on the last one, it was actually less than that, but that's a pretty large scale project. So we right. usually use $3 per watt for a roof mounted installation. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that last one also had a, a significant amount of grade mounted installation too, which. So that, uh, so that means a 90,000 uh, kilowatt hour oh. array would uh, cost approximately. Well, a 90,000 kilowatt hour. Um, I'd say that would be roughly Eight eighty kilowatt array, so two hundred forty thousand. So uh, okay, so about two hundred. So, yeah, because right now I mean, I'm not, we're looking yeah. at one hundred three is producing one hundred twenty eight. 
you well, I'm, you know, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to uh, box you into a price as much as, you know, get an understanding order of magnitude. Oh, right. You know, we're trying to you know, you know, use our thumbs here to get a right. good idea. Right. You said uh, three dollars a watt. I, th I assume you meant three dollars a kilowatt. No, three dollars of watt of array. So every single one of these panels shown is 360 watts was rated for. So that's under ideal okay. laboratory conditions. That's the amount of power I'm going to get when the sun's hitting this panel. Um, so basically, solar arrays are, are sized by the kilowatt or megawatt. And that's just a rating of all the panels added together. Got it. To make that size, yeah. So roughly on this example, we're somewhere a Above and beyond three hundred thousand dollars, right? With right, because it would be time. It would be three AW. times one hundred and twenty-eight. Right. So, but we're also producing more than than your what was that the two thousand nineteen annual demand. Mm -hmm. So it could be pared back down to to meet that. You know, part because part of our scope of work, if we can, <laughs> I guess, move on. Um, is that confirm the existing conditions you know we we look at all your utility bills and you know do a deeper dive in, into your electrical system and, and loads and what's being used and all that and then you know as part of this project kickoff and and a preliminary analysis that's that's where we set the table for success and then we design to that um we also need to talk to ComEd early and, you know, make sure they're aware of what we're doing uh, because they're going to have a, a pretty big say in the interconnection because mm -hmm. we are going to be co-generating with them. And um, they always appreciate early communication. You know, the last thing they want is to uh, have a surprise application <laughs> for interconnection uh, when they had no idea anything was coming because it, it impacts what they're doing too. Um, when you say high efficiency, what kind of efficiency percentage are we looking at in terms of uh, power conversion? We're looking at the Sun Power module, the X uh, series module, which is one of the highest, if not the highest, on the market at about twenty-three percent efficiency. Okay. Fair enough. The uh, I believe the theoretical maximum <laughs> is is not even sixty percent. Uh, so. Um, it, it's pretty good. It, it's, it's getting better. It keeps creeping up. Real world or 23% laboratory? 23% real world. Okay. Yep. Okay. Hey, uh, were you, I'm sorry, where did we leave off? Are you in, uh, still reading? No. Through? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, talking about the approach, how we'd go through the project with you. Um, you know, so we would, create the design documents, including estimates for construction cost. Um, we submit the final design documents for construction as well as permit review. And then when we go into bidding, you know, we, we'd assist in the bidding, uh, do a initial pre-bid walkthrough with any contractors, answer questions, create any addenda if necessary. Um, we'd be available to help with the evaluation of the contractor bids. And uh, during construction, we'd, uh, of course, provide on-site review of the installation. We'd um, help with filling out any forms uh, for interconnecting with the utility. We'd review submittals, answer contractor questions, um, provide final inspections, closeout, assist in startup, um, basically you know, be your uh, advocate during, during the construction process. Okay. Of course, you know, we'd be... We're a 60 year company and we'll, we'll be around even after the projects close. So um, All right. any additional questions that we may be able to answer? Yeah, I think so. I know I have some questions and, and I'm going to start off, but I'm also going to ask you to take down the document so I can oh. see everyone. Otherwise I can't see who has their hand okay. up. If I can't see the gallery view, which it's hard to get up when there's a, there, thank you. Thank you very yep. much. So anyway, uh, I'll start off with a couple of questions. I'm sure others, people love others. Page 86, it looks like your fee proposal is 19900 Is that right? That, that'd be the fee for your company were you to do this work, correct? That, that's for the design and right. yes, yeah, basically everything yeah. that we discussed in that project approach, yeah. Okay, and then the, the panels themselves you think would cost an additional 
somewhere between two hundred forty to three hundred thousand. Is, yeah, is that what I well, heard? Well, that that would be yeah. That that's that's the construction installed cost. That's the panels. That's the racking, inverters, okay. um, interconnection. Yeah, that that's basically what we see for this type of project in that three dollars okay. per watt range. So you recommended a ballast type. Um, yes. You your company would provide the structural analysis, yes, correct? correct? And let, let's say the structural analysis came back and said, oh, your roof, it can't hold all that ballast and the panels and everything like that. Uh, that then what? Uh, or you, would you recommend we do something else to our roof? Or would you then as an alternative suggest we kind of, I think, it, I don't know what you call them, bolted down panels? What do you, what do you call them? Well, that would be well, it'd be a mechanically fastened system is, is what we would call it, where it's actually um, attached directly to the system. And, and that would reduce the weight of the array on the roof. Um, but then you start running into other potential issues with the roof. Uh, we'd have to work on phasing the construction of the array with the roofing project. Uh, you'd want the structure for the panels to be in place so you can roof up to and, and flash around all those mounting points. Otherwise, we can look at other alternatives. There's maybe um, that eastern roof area, while not as desirable because it's pitched, um, we'd have to evaluate, but I'd have to have my structural engineer actually look at that structure. As far as I'm aware, there's no existing drawings that, that we, we have anyhow um, to evaluate. or maybe a carport solution would, would be beneficial. Um, What's that? that? That would be, um, as in one of those pictures, um, we showed Campbell soup. Um, basically it's canopies over the parking stalls. My, so, my initial reaction is, my recollection is it comes out to about five pounds a square foot. The For the ballast? PV system. The ballasted system, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, according to some powers literature, um, just the panels and racking itself is about two and a half pounds a square foot. But then you have to add the ballast on top of that and the amount of ballast you need is dependent on wind loading. Okay, all right. Um, does anyone else have some questions of uh, these gentlemen regarding their proposal? Gacky? Hi, yes, I just have a question about the site visits. Um, will you be doing periodic visits? Is there a limited amount of visits that you do that are included in your bid or is it just, how does that work? During construction, uh, I assume is what you're, talking yes. about. Okay. Um, it could be as often as bi-weekly just to ensure that the construction is being done per drawings and specifications. Okay. So there's no limit to how many times you could come out? No. It's, the price that we have now. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Uh, yes. Linda. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just wondering if you could define code generating with ComEd. Okay. Um, Commonwealth Edison has power generation plants all over. Basically, they make some of their own power and then they have other locations that make power, wind farms, all that stuff. It goes on their grid and they're delivering power through their grid to your building. Now you're generating power too. So they're generating power, bringing it to you, you're generating power and possibly giving it to them. So you are both making power at the same time and trying to feed the same loads inside your building. And they want to know how much you're making, when you're making it, and they also want to be able to de-energize you in case there's a power outage because their linemen could be working on the lines. They think it's dead when you're actually feeding power back onto the grid. Great, because that was my next question. <laughs> yeah, they, they, About power they, outages and do we still have a ComEd bill? 
Yes, you will have a comment bill. It, it, there's certain fees built into your comment bill that are don't rely on the amount of power you use. I haven't actually seen your bill. I'm not sure what rate tier you're in, but obviously the more power you use, the, the different tiers and the way your build is different. Um, but yeah, you will have a ComEd bill, but it won't be nearly as, as high as what you would be paying mm -hmm. at this we, moment. Uh, Mike, we currently uh, are part of a, uh, um, a purchasing agreement mm -hmm. uh, with the consortium. So we're getting our energy actually through Constellation, but we still pay Commonwealth Edison transmission line fees. Right, right. So you and probably I, and I know different Constellation, but you'd still have to pay all the line fees. Okay. Well, I know that some line fees are uh, volume dependent and you know some just are a flat fee. Yes. Um, I just don't remember what the splits are on that. No, and it, like I said, it, it it varies depending on your rate tier. Right. Okay. So just to finalize, yeah, Linda. so we would, if there was a power outage in our area, we would still be supplying our own electric mostly or all, depending on how many solar panels we have. If you don't have your own power storage where you can you divorce anything. yourself from ComEd, uh, sure. um, basically every inverter that is what we call grid interactive where it looks at the grid so it knows what type of power to produce for lack of a better term um, it has something called internal anti-islanding protection w what they don't want is for you to become an island producing your own power because it's unsafe for the linemen so if the grid goes away, your solar power goes away. Got it. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, one more question, then I think we should let these gentlemen go. Diane? Thank you. Um, yeah, we're currently um, working with uh, companies that will be um, renovating the roof or fixing parts of it. Do you work with them before if we decide to do anything with your company? Do you work with the building um, in contractors this, or? In this particular instance, yes, we would work with them. Um, there's projects such as that uh, Emmett Bean Federal Center in Indianapolis. We, we replaced that whole roof, but that was part of our contract to do that roof replacement design and the solar design. So we were able to coordinate in, in house. Now that we have a separate basic, uh, we have a separate firm doing the design and, and installation of the new roof, we'd have to coordinate with them what we're doing. If we need penetrations, we have to met, let them know where they need to be so they can plan for that type of thing. Oh, thank you. Um, do any of these solar panels, does this whole system have batteries? This would be battery free. Basically, you would be using the grid as your battery. So, so we don't in, in round, it. No, in round terms, let, let's say you need 10 kilowatts, kilowatt hours uh, per day or whatever and you produce 20 kilowatt hours you would be putting that additional 10 on the grid and basically banking it for say a cloudy day when you produce next to no solar power okay so is there any maintenance that we would have to follow on a regular basis the the maintenance that you would have would be going on um you'd want to certified person who would do this of course you go on the roof make sure the panels are all um a clean because if they get dirty um their efficiency goes down um on top of that is making sure periodically that the uh, connections are tightened there's no loose wires or anything that could you know lead to a, a potential short anything like that um if you had batteries you would have more maintenance. Typically your installation cost for the array would double 
And the batteries, depending on what you buy, are only good for five to eight years. I mean, that's eight years is high-end lithium ion type batteries. Um, so that, that's another cost that you have to replace throughout the life of a PV array, which is, if you can avoid using batteries, I would recommend it for those reasons. Okay, just one last question. Is there a warranty or is there a life expectancy for them? Um, yes, they're, they're warranted. Each manufacturer has their different warran warranties. Uh, so power is, is one we like to design around. doesn't mean you know, being a public entity, we can't guarantee you'll get some power. Um, but they have a multiple tiers based on the panels itself and the wiring. And um, typically, we, we say that the useful life of a PV array is 25 years. And at the end of their... 20-year the warranty, the panels. 20, yeah. And then the inverters, I don't recall. Is that 10? Does that 10, sound right? I think it's 10 on the inverters. And um, they do have a recycling program, too. Um, many manufacturers do this, uh, where they take the panels at the end of life and they strip it down and take off all the reusable materials to make more solar panels. Okay. okay thank you. All right. Thank all right. you very much. Um, uh, we appreciate your presentation and answering all the questions that we've had. Um, so we're going to continue with our meeting, but uh, you can uh, go on and do the rest of uh, the things that you need to do in your homes right now. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening and uh, for answering all the questions. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, thank guys. You. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, Susan, do we have, oh, yes, we do. Okay. Um, just, we want to sort of move this along a little bit. We're uh, running a little behind here, of course. Um, but we have a couple of guests who are joining us now. And I understand you are from uh, Patrick Engineering. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yes, ma'am. Patrick All Engineering. Right, would you uh, please uh, introduce yourself? And I see there's a Christopher Irwin who is here also. Is that right? That's correct. All right, uh, I'm attempting to fix my video right now. All right. Well, you do that, Dan. I'm at Freeston. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and then perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the materials that you sent to us. All right. Um, so I've got, uh, I've got a presentation. Can I, uh, can, can I show this presentation? Uh, okay. Well, can you tell me how long it is? It's uh, in total of, of about nine minutes. Um, well, okay. And then a question, a Q&A after, afterward. Um, okay, all right. Okay, very good. I will share it now. All right. Uh, let's see, can, can you see the presentation? Uh, yes, I okay, can. Can good. everyone else? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. One second, please. Okay. Okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> and one more adjustment here. Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Don Freeston from Patrick Engineering. And uh, with me tonight is our senior structural engineer, Chris Irwin. Um, thank you for this opportunity to uh, introduce you to Patrick Engineering. Um, tonight, I would like to tell you a little bit about Patrick, our history, the services we provide, the depth and breadth of the, our uh, utilities and renewables team, and then answer any questions you may have about Patrick or the information we previously provided you on November 5th. Um, the key, uh, key personnel for this project will be me, Chris Irwin, and Al Hymans. Um, I'm an electrical engineer with 21 years of experience in the commercial consulting electrical engineering industry. I'm the director of Patrick's electric and renewables engineering team within our utilities and renewables division. And for this project, I will be the project manager. Some of our uh, vast photovoltaic experience includes some of the following. Um, I'm, I was the uh, quality control engineer for a 27.6 DC megawatt solar farm in Kansas. I was the project manager for a 65 DC kilowatt rooftop array in, in DuPage County. I was the lead electrical engineer for a 60.48 uh, DC kilowatt rooftop array in the city of Chicago. 
and then another 35.1 DC kilowatt uh, rooftop array in the city of Chicago. And I was also the lead electrical engineer for two EV charging stations at Patrick's headquarters in, in uh, Lyle. Chris Irwin is our senior structural engineer in charge of our structural engineering team. Um, for this project, Chris and his team will evalu evaluate the existing roof structure to, to determine if the solar arrays can so safely be added to the roof. His uh, structural design uh, ex experience includes a wide array of different types of stru structures, which include high-rise, long span, industrial, and commercial. His experience for photovoltaic uh, systems include, um, he was th the lead structural engineer for the 27.6 uh, DC megawatt solar farm in Kansas. He was the lead structural engineer for the 65 DC kilowatt rooftop array in DuPage County. Um, he was the lead structural engineer for um, the solar canopy and EV uh, charging stations in, in the city of Chicago. And he was the lead structural engineer for the city of Berwyn's um, pub public library retrofit, to name a few. Um, Al Hyman's wanted to be in attendance with us tonight, but he's currently suffering from a personal medical illness. Um, he's our, our He's my main electrical guru, our main PV guru. Um, he's our senior electrical engineer with 52 years of experience and we will be the lead electrical engineer for this project. His uh, photovoltaic experience is not limited to the, the, the following. He was the, 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 the uh, lead electrical engineer for the 27.6 DC megawatt farm in, in Kansas. He was the lead electrical engineer for the 65 uh, DC kilowatt rooftop array in DuPage County. He was, uh, <clears throat> he has vast experience providing solar studies using software such as he Helioscope, uh, PV Syst, SAM, uh, which stands for System Advisor Model, PV Watts, which are both uh, from the National uh, Renewables Energy Lab. Um, at Patrick, we pr pride ourselves um, as smart people with bright ideas who achieve powerful results. Established in 1979 by a team of in, in, uh, industry veterans as an engineering design, construction, management services, and technology firm to serve clients better than larger enterprises. We are a people, people first organization with more than 300 team members ready to meet the needs and challenges of our clients. We serve our clients with integrity through hands-on and collaborative experience to ensure successful delivery. Um, to meet structured solutions and management to technical challenges for an, an evolving market. Uh, we're headquartered in, in uh, Lyle, Illinois, and operating through multiple regional offices. We are a nationwide company having performed work in all 50 states. Again, Patrick Engineering is a soup to nuts firm who can fulfill all of your engineering design, construction, management services, and technology needs. Our key disciplines include electrical engineering and power systems, structural and civil engineering, survey, and construction management, to name a few. Our four key uh, divisions at Patrick are our utilities and renewables division, industrial infrastructure, management services, and transportation. Um, there are, uh, these are the separate teams within my uh, utilities and renewables division. My uh, electrical and renewables engineering team has 15 electrical engineers and designers, and Chris's structural engineering team has five structural engineers, some of which will be used on this project. I'd now like to inform you about some of our recent projects, uh, our, our key recent uh, photovoltaic projects. So we are currently wrapping up this, uh, this project for the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County at their Willowbrook Wildlife Center. This project, including the size and the scope of the services, was extremely uh, sim similar to the scope and services for the, the project at this, uh, this Niles Main District uh, Library. For this project, we performed an in-depth survey of electrical distribution, the roof structure, and the electricity usage. We provided a concept level design and solar slash ROI uh, 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 analysis using helioscope to present to uh, DuPage County. After that, we created detailed engineering drawings and specifications to construct from. We aided DuPa DuPage County in the bidding process and made recommendations for the best qualified contractors. 
Uh, during construction, we answered contractor RFIs, we reviewed shop drawings, and performed periodic site visits to the, to the job site to ensure compliance with the specifications. After construction, we performed a uh, closeout inspection and a, and a punch list. Um, this, this project is a 65 kilowatt DC rooftop solar array, which is anticipated to generate just over 80,000 kilowatt hours annually of electricity, allowing them to island off of the utility during normal operations. Um, the uh, construction only took a couple weeks and uh, caused no interruptions to daily facility uh, activities. For this project, DuPage County is using this to roll out their green initiative and they want it, it on a full display for the general public. The array, combiners, and inverters um, are all visitor, uh, visible to, the, to, to its visitors. Um, eventually, they want to procure, procure funding for um, a, um, you know, HMI display board so that the general public can see the PV generation versus the, facil the facility's construction. Um, next, uh, so last year we provided this, uh, um, completed this 27.6 megawatt DC ut utility grade solar array in Johnson City, Kansas. Um, our services for this project included civil, structural, and, and electrical engineering design. This large array is anticipated to gener generate over a whopping 29,800,000 kilowatt hours annually. This is our, uh, our pilot PV power system uh, project that we completed about 10 years ago. Um, it's a 10 kilowatt DC array installed on the, the roof of the um, Ralph H. Metcalf Federal Building in the city of Chicago. And for this project, we wanted to, to, to use it to learn all aspects of photovoltaic uh, systems since at that, at that point, we made the decision to venture into the, uh, the PV market um, at that time. Um, we provided an electrical and structural engineering design. We procured all of the materials and equipment and then constructed, tested, and commissioned the overall system uh, successfully. And uh, this work included a detailed work plan to accommodate an accelerated uh, completion date. And, you know, with all that said, um, you know, at this point, I'd like to field any questions you may have regarding Patrick Engineering or our, our potential involvement on this project. Thank, thank you very much. Would you mind uh, just taking down the document uh, so that I can see everyone and uh, that way I can tell who has their hand up and who might be asking uh, to, uh, to ask some questions. Yes, ma'am, uh, I want to stop sharing my screen. Okay, all right. There you go. Uh, there okay, you go. great, great. Thank you very much, thank you very much. So I'll, I'll just start out and I'm gonna give, so, well, Omer, you already have your, your hand up. Why don't you go ahead and then I'll ask a question. But you have Still to muted. take muted off. Mayor, Mayor, we can't hear you. Uh, sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, no problem. So I wanted to know, uh, thanks for your uh, excellent presentation. I wanted to know what type of photovoltaic cells, like who's the manufacturer, would you be using? And what are the efficiency of those cells? Yeah, so we commonly use uh, one of two manufacturers for the most part, uh, um, uh, Sun World and, and uh, uh, solar, uh, solar Power. Um, the overall efficiency for those, uh, yeah. Um, uh, solar World, sorry. Solar World and, and Sun World, sorry. And uh, the overall efficiency for those are they're pretty similar. They're right, right about 25%. 25%. Okay. And what is the cost per, uh, you know, what's the cost of an array? And then, you know, what's the size of the, you know, like, is it three per $3, $2, $3? Or like, what are we looking at for a while? Basically? Yeah. So every year, this, these, these systems get more and more efficient. Uh, overall, the, the, the cost per watt is going down uh, per year. Um, right now, we're right at about 2.8 to $3 per watt. Okay. And what do you estimate for this, uh, for the library? I mean, what size of array in your estimation do you think you can install and based on our needs? Yeah, so we've run some preliminary numbers. Um, however, you know, at this point, you know, we haven't really dug deep into, into the, 
um, actual size of the array that can be installed on the roof there. Um, you know, looking at the drawings that were provided, you know, I'm seeing some, some uh, uh, you know, quite a few roof penetrations, you know, we're, uh, you know, we don't have all of the documentation for all of the roof structures. We, you know, we have the, the, the roof structure for the building addition installed in 1996. Um, you know, the preliminary HeLa scope that we ran, we're looking at about a 100, uh, 100 um, uh, kilowatt system. But that can, that can change, you know, dramatically. Okay. Um, so I have a few questions, but I'm also watching for other people's hands here. Um, so uh, I'm looking at your letter to Susan Lemke, which is page 94 of our packet. And it says, it describes the scope of the work. And uh, one of the things you say is survey the library's roof for possible placement of photovoltaic panels. So I want to know, are you going to do a structural analysis to see how much weight our roof can hold? Or are you just looking at it in terms of where you would put the panels? Yeah, so, so both. We would do a detailed analysis, um, you know, from an electrical and, and structural engineering standpoint. Um, you know, so as it stands, you know, and we've, we've looked at, uh, you know, we've, you know, looked at roughly, uh, you know, the, the structure, the existing structure for the drawings that we were provided for the building addition uh, installed in 1996. You know, we have a lot of great, great information there. Um, you know, if, if we had the, uh, the, the um, as-built drawings for the original structures, um, that's, that would help us out quite a bit. If we don't have those as-built drawings, then we're going to have to go back, uh, go out into the field and do a detailed um, analysis, you know, Chris, Chris Irwin I could, could add a little more, we're looking at, you know, at least two structural engineers, at least an entire day on site, looking at the existing structure and making that eva evaluation. And then from an electrical engineering standpoint, we want to get a, a, a thorough understanding of your uh, electrical, your electrical in, in, uh, distribution infrastructure at, at the library as well. And we're going to look for play, uh, potential places where we can tie into the, the uh, existing electrical, excuse me, the electrical distribution system. So I noticed your fee was forty thousand dollars. This work that you just described right now would that be an additional cost? Uh, the structural roof analysis and all the things you just mentioned, or would that be included within the fee that is? Uh, it's on page ninety-six of our packet, page three of your packet. Page three of your letter. Yeah, so d depending on a couple things now. So, uh, you know, depending on um, your existing usage and how many, how many, uh, how many um, overall um, cells or, 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 yeah, cells we, we, we would need. Um, if we can fit all those cells on this, the structure provided to, uh, or uh, um, in the drawings provided um, in 1996, then all of that's included. Um, also, you know, I would say that, you know, if we had as built drawings of the, the original structures as well, and they provide the existing uh, structural loads, you know, um, more than likely at that point, um, we can provide that in the existing um, fee as well. If we have to go back out and spend an, uh, an, an absorbent, absorbent amount of time, um, you know, surveying the existing structure and, you um, you know, documenting the existing or making calculations of of the uh, um, existing roof structure, the original roof structure, then that 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 fee could go up. Okay, and are you recommending, or at this point, would you see it's best for us to use ballast or bolted down pan panels? Uh, Chris, I'll 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 let you field that one. Yeah, so at, at this point, based on the information I have, so this is only on the 96 expansion, um, that roof system was designed uh, per Boca 93, which had a fairly uh, de minimis uplift load. The current code uplift is actually quite a bit more than, than what was required uh, under the Boca 93 code. So uh, in, initially, because I know that the roof system is joists, I prefer to attach directly to the joists because you get more out, you can, you can get more in terms of capacity. And the problem is the roof, was designed for 30 pounds per square foot. Now, the, the book, um, the drawings only said 30 pounds per square foot snow plus drift. And the problem is when you're looking at the joist system, 
Uh, we're looking at putting three pounds per square foot. Uh, if you look at current code for snow, it's probably about 22 to 23 pounds per square foot. So you have seven pounds per square foot cushion. Problem is if you have suspended ceilings, other things, that eats into that allowance. So we have to look at it from that perspective and we're load accountants. We're looking at, at how much load the building is expected to take versus how much we plan on putting onto the building. Now, in terms of wind uplift, there's basically two approaches. One, you add ballast to basically counteract the wind uplift. Uh, option two would be you attach directly and uh, one of the more curious things you can do with Joyce is often you can install bridging to aid in the uplift resistance. Uh, that usually involves understanding who manufactured the joists and, and where they go. That's usually not, usually we try and handle this on the load side. We make sure that we are good, we are good with the structure as is because every time you touch the structure, you increase the cost of the project and make the likelihood of success less. So our goal is to try and make the existing structure work for the current code. Now, obviously the longer you get from the construction date, the harder that becomes. But looking at this one, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility. I think there's enough reserve capacity that you could either accommodate uh, a light ballasted system or you could tie directly to it possibly with some joist bridging. But, and it's possible there might be joist bridging already installed because the roof system is a light system. Uh, as, t t as Don was mentioning, any existing documentation you have that basically eliminates the need to go out there and actually survey everything, it, it just adds to it. So if you have old shop drawings, that's good to provide if you have uh, as built drawings from, from the construction, all of those things. I know uh, different organizations have various levels of how much of that they maintain, but the more of that you have, the, the, the more easy it is for us to do, do the evaluation without the added cost of having to go out there and, 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 eval and survey the entire structure or the entire roof, I should say. Didn't you say that you did know that our roof was designed to hold 30 uh, pounds per square foot? Did I hear you say that? And if you said that, how do you know that? Uh, it's, it's in the drawings. The drawings note that it was designed for 30 pounds. He's talking truck. about the 1996 edition. That's Just correct. Expansion. Just correct. the 96 yep. edition. I don't, I don't know that we have um, drawings from 1961. Okay. Okay. Um, other questions from the, the floor here. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. All right. Um, if not then I think, you know, we have your materials here and we can continue to look through them. Um, and we uh, appreciate your presentation and, and all the information that we have here. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And we'll let you get back to uh, your families and other things that you might have to do. Thank you. So thank thanks. you all very much. We appreciate Sorry this opportunity. Wait for a while too. Oh, Sorry. not a thank problem. You. Anytime. Thank you very much. Thank all you. right. Have a good evening. Everybody have a good evening. Okay, we have one final group, right? Linda? Yeah, they're, si they're in the process of uh, signing in. Signing in? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Simpson. Can you hear me? I can. Good evening. Hi, how are you? I'm um, good, how are you? Good, and you are from um, Circle Design Group, is that correct? I am with Circle Design Group and expect uh, several more people here to log in shortly. Oh, okay, fine, fine. Uh, while, while we're waiting, perhaps you can uh, explain something. Uh, we have a packet uh, from Circle Design and it, it seems to have information from, as I was going through this, I thought, wait a minute, how many companies are there? Uh, are there a number of like sub companies that work for you that were included in the packet? Like I see this, this information from McComas O'Donnell Nacarado. And I thought, well, wait a minute, are these a different company or is this part of your company? Can you explain that much anyway? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, other firms that we typically partner with. Uh, Lancer Beebe, the architect, we, uh, we do numerous projects with them. We've got a project where Lancer Beebe uh, the structural engineer and uh, PSG, we're all working together on the same elementary school on the south side of Indianapolis uh, currently. Okay, so they're not part of your firm, but you work with them. Okay, correct. All right, correct. all right. You can tell me when. Uh, uh, let's see. You have two people here. Um, did you want to get started? Uh, if if you want to make any preliminary remarks, we'd like to hear them. Yep. And I see there are at least two of you are on the uh, Zoom right now. Right. And now we have three. 
Okay. Yeah, we, we got several jumping on, and and I know David and uh, PS, PSG will will have some comments. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, do you want to get started, or do you need, do you want to wait? Hang on just a moment. I'll see where everybody's at. I, I think uh, David is their lead, uh, Karen, and okay. um, I and he just I just saw him sign in. So uh, okay. If All we right. can get them into uh, into the room, I think we'll be in good shape. All right. Um, Susan uh, Lemke, by the way, do we have anyone sign in for public comment tonight? Uh, I believe Tisha Dowdy Ashcroft wants to speak, and she's okay. here. Um, is there a Jennifer with you? Yes. Okay. Okay, all right, is everyone here from the circle group? Uh, I think we got a couple or one more. You're gonna outnumber us Wait. pretty soon. David, this is Greg. Why don't uh, why don't we get started? And um, you know, in the interest of time, um, and you've been very patient. I appreciate uh, you and your team's uh, patience. And uh, this evening, it's a lot of information to uh, digest. Um, so, uh, I, again, I appreciate it. So, if you uh, wouldn't mind uh, kicking things off, I'd, you know, that would be great. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, so first off, I'd just like to say thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak to you guys tonight. This uh, sounds like a very exciting project, and we're happy to, uh, to hope and hopefully we'll end up being a part of it. Um, so let's just do kind of a quick introduction first. Uh, my name is David Barrientos. I am the Director of Mechanical Engineering with Circle Design Group. We're an MEP engineering firm out of Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, Barry Simpson is uh, my counterpart. Um, he's with Circle Design Group. He's our Director of Electrical Engineering. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, Tom Miltner um, with McComas, O'Donnell, and Nakarado. Um, he's a Regional Director for them, and they are Structural Engineers. And then we've got um, PSG Energy Group is our uh, Solar um, Engineering Partner. And we've got Jennifer Merzlach, who's the President. Um, Brian McCormick is an operations manager, and then Josh Rabels, a uh, design engineer for PSG. Um, and then just joining us is uh, Terry Lancer, uh, principal with Lancer Plus BB Architects. So uh, just, I know that's a lot, but you know, we're, uh, we just want to kind of keep this, we've got a small presentation put together. We just want to kind of keep this as open. So if you guys have any questions, um, go ahead, unmute yourself, um, ask away. We're, we're not, uh, you know, don't have like a super strict format here. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer um, and she's going to go ahead and start talking about uh, the project. Okay, great. Great. Thank you, David. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Wow. There we go. So David did give the introductions. We, um, I assume David, we could follow up and share this with you and it would have our names and the teams talking tonight. Um, one thing I'd like to hit on is that uh, David covered really the teams you have here and some of the expertise we have in these projects. And we all individually have expertise in this space, but we've also worked together in the past and the Clark Pleasant Community Schools is one of the most recent projects um, we've teamed up on together. Um, this here highlights PSG's project 
portfolio experience with um, on-site solar projects. So we um, are based in Indiana. We do quite a bit in Indiana, Illinois, and some in Michigan, um, and a lot in the public space with K through 12, municipalities, libraries, et cetera. Um, so again, this kind of just highlights our portfolio where I was all, and I think you've had all the qualifications sent over before, so I don't want to take up the time here. Um, but I will say, I know COVID is providing some challenges, but if you, um, when things open up some more and if people wanted to do a visit, we are, um, we've, we have six projects for that could be toured at the West Aurora School District, so we could help arrange that at some point. Um, again, I know it's been a long night for everybody, so I don't want to take too much time, but we hit on the drivers for the library. Um, I'd say that innovation and environmental impact are usually driving factors to start um, reviewing or having interest in a project, but that to get the project across the finish line, it has to have that um, financial aspect, the cost out opportunity as well. So solar projects provide the opportunity to reduce current utility spent and exposure to unpredictable rates, um, allows you to reallocate funds that you budgeted in those operations for other investments. Um, again, there's an education component that's always big at the schools, but I find it to be really big at libraries too, to be be able to provide workshops um, for either like field trips and students, but also just for the community in general. And then the environment impact of being a committed partner to your patrons in the community and offsetting your CO2 footprint. Um, and please, like David said, jump in and ask any questions along the way. Here we have two options for you using one roof, which would be a smaller project, obviously, and then using both of those flat roof spaces, uh, doing that does get you to nearly offset. So you had approximately 90,000 kilowatt hours of consumption. Um, we like to design and, and we would, the whole process of finalizing, you know, the design recommended would be to understand what other efficiencies there may be in the building or consumption growth or decline you would see having. Um, I'll get to it later in the presentation, but this one here, you know, is roughly 95%, 94% offset. We like to go target our designs really more to 80 to 90% if there's opportunity for efficiency in the future. Um, but if you have LED and you have efficient HVAC and you think you've pushed it as low as you can, then we would go higher to that 95% range. And that's mainly done because you won't get any benefit if the system's too large. If you overproduce one day um, with net metering, the ComEd utility, um, you will get that back to use on a day you're underproducing. But if you continuously overproduce, if you end up having year after year a surplus, it's not gonna end up doing you any good. So you don't wanna spend more on a project than you need to. Good point. Um, have you guys done any upgrades in as far as LEDs or anything like that in inside the building or, parking uh, lot or anything? Yeah, we have. Um, you know, we took out all our metal halide uh, lights in the parking lot and replaced them with LEDs. Uh, we've done all the exterior lights on the building. Uh, we've replaced them with LEDs. Um, and then on the interior, um, as uh, you know, fixtures age and, and uh, we, we need to start replacing ballasts and, and so forth. We're, uh, you know, we're converting the uh, interior spaces to uh, more efficient lighting. Uh, and we have seen our, um, our demand drop year over year, um, you know, to try to, you know, keep a handle on it. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, we, Again, in the sake of time, we kind of blurred through, you know, the introductions, but I think everyone across our team supports efficiencies and pushing down consumption versus 
building an array that produces more energy than you need. Yeah, certainly. So that could always be sidebar conversations as well. Um, before I move on, any questions here? And like we said, we do have Josh from our team on the phone who did the preliminary designs. Are there anything specific to the design layouts? Um, maybe if we could save our questions to the end. Uh, part of the problem is, is when you have something on the screen, I can't see who's raising their hand. Oh, okay. So I, I can only see some of their participants unless I keep, you know, scrolling back and forth, huh. I try to do that. But it might be best if we just, if you just sort of go through and then we'll, we'll ask our questions at the end. That sounds good. Okay. Um, I am gonna now, I'm gonna hand it over to Tom and Brian. And this slide here talks about the different roof mount options. Um, we really have three of them. We often do the balusted or flush mount, and then we also could talk about uh, structural frame supports if that's needed. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, again, Brian McCormick, uh, with operations side of PSG. Um, so we have uh, in the pictures here, you can see um, the top two, as Jennifer notes here, are a ballasted. So basically, it's a uh, a, a frame, a racking frame that holds the panel in place and it's it's for the most part weighted down with these uh, concrete block and they can range in weight um, and, and we'll go through an engineering process to uh, based on the building height, the, the location and whatnot, we will have that engineered to uh, a specific um, weight requirement and then work with Tom and his group on what um, what the options are. So he'll look at the structure, obviously and he can talk more of that, but he'll look at the structure and tell us what uh, the capacity is and, and we kind of work around that with the different types of racking that are available. Um, for the roof types that, the flat roofs, it would be similar to the top two pictures versus that lower flush mount um, option. That's typically for um, a steeper roof or a metal roof. So with the PVC roof, which I think is what I heard um, is the possible option for the re-roof, um, it, it'd be a ballast roof. So we try to, there are options, we can either ballast it, there are other options if there's racking options, if you don't like the, the block look, they actually we have some racking where you can actually hide the block underneath the panel, or you can go with um, a, a mechanically fastened potentially, depending on the substrate underneath or the, the roof deck, but mechanically fastened um, racking system. But the downside of that is more penetrations in the roof that the roofer would have to flash around. So a couple different options. Yeah. Um, and, and I'd say, you know, as far as looks, um, oh my gosh, it's going too fast. But once you pull out and you're in the drone images, you don't even tell, right, that there's the ballasted right. blocks and so forth. So um, I know sometimes when you see it up really close like that, people start to have concern, but. But it, again, there are, there are, and there are options, multiple options in different, different systems that we can look at depending on preference. So the, the top, um, the ballasted option, you know, again, we'd work with, with McComas uh, on those weight requirements. As, as the slide here notes, it's typically a five to seven pounds per square foot versus a flush mount, which is quite a bit less because there's, there's a lesser amount of concrete block. But um, so we, we go through, you know, we'll work with the roofing manufacturers and the roofing contractors to make sure we uphold any warranties, uh, roof warranties. Um, and go through that process of inspection process and whatnot. So that should all be intact. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add, Tom. Yeah, I can just, you know, basically we're on board just to make sure whatever system is selected that the existing structure will obviously support it. And in extreme cases, if we can't get what we need out of the roofing system, uh, we can come up with a uh, rack mounted system that would basically be supported from the, the main structure, not just laying on the roof. That would be an extreme case. Hopefully we can avoid that, but 
we'll have to do a little investigative work first and uh, see what we've actually got to work with there. Okay, great. Thank you guys. Now I'm gonna change gears and jump into more of the financial side and incentives with the project. Um, the, the first one is the net metering that I spoke of before. So you will have a bi-directional meter in place and at any point you could be, the ray could be producing more than you're consuming or producing less than what you're consuming. So when it's producing more, it's gonna to export to the utility and the utility, you know, technically that the electricity is used immediately, but they will bank the kilowatt hours for you. So essentially they're a storage system for you. Um, and that's, you'll see it as a line item on your bill after the solar project. Um, and then when it's the arrays producing less than what you need, the utility sends the electricity and technically as far as the billing goes, they draw on that bank before they start charging you for kilowatt hours. So when you saw the, um, this having you know 90 percent plus offset well obviously it's not producing during the evening hours the chicago winters so forth but it um it's overproducing on some of those sunny sundays in the summer it's getting banked up and then you could draw from it later um the the next option is specific to comed Com i'm sure you're more familiar with um LED rebates, but ComEd also has a, di a distributed generation rebate. And currently, um, and it has been this way for the past two years, it's $250 per kilowatt of system install. And that's a one-time rebate. Um, then specific to Illinois is the Illinois Adjustable Block Program. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, but if you if you have interest in solar, you probably um, have some familiarity. But how it works is the uh, program you will get, um, it's front loaded. So they look at your production of the array for 15 years and they take all that and they spread it over the first five years. So the first five years you're raising production, you're gonna get value back from the RECs. Um, typically IPA is the one that's in the counter contract. Um, and currently for this size array in the most recent round, it's $58 a REC. And one REC is a thousand kilowatt hours. So for every thousand kilowatt hours you produce, you create a REC. Um, now I know that means, to keep in mind with sustainability, that means that you technically aren't offsetting your own footprint, um, but you're helping the overall regional utility offset CO2. So you just think about it like that. And I would, you know, highly recommend being a, a public space that you take this added value. It will help with the payoff of the project. And then in the long run, post that time period, you can retire the RECs. Um, and, and the life of the system is going to be longer than 15 years. The, the next one is a federal incentive, and it is tied to a taxable entity. It's an investment tax credit. It's been dropping down every year in its value, and in 2021, it's going to be 22%. Um, this would be for the whole, the whole project. For a roof mount, everything's going to be eligible. Um, now, to obtain that, you need to have a taxable entity in part of the financing and procurement. And most straightforward way is a third-party ownership, and with that, too, is a power purchase agreement. That's a PPA. On your, your end, you now would be getting a utility bill for any remaining consumption purchase from the utility, and you'd be getting a second bill that would look similar. You'd have a a kilowatt hour charge, um, but it would be a reduced, a discounted kilowatt hour charge and you wouldn't have any upfront cost in the project. That's another nice aspect of the PPA. 
And then finally, I want to mention our team is always looking for grants for our clients. And it's kind of like, a, um, you know, college scholarships. It can get very nuanced and focused. And there is one specific to libraries for on-site solar. And that's through EBSCO or EBSCO. Um, and last year, or well, this, this current year, 2020, they did give out $300,000 in grants and they spread it across five different libraries. Um, and that's a, it's a pretty straightforward one. We would help with the technical portion of that grant application. Okay, and I know you wanted to take questions at the end, so I'm more than willing to go back to specific slides for people's questions. Um, to wrap it up here, a few additional benefits. Um, the first I hit on earlier was really the education aspect of it. So our team of engineers is, you know, really hands-on with our clients, um, students, community members, um, kind of typical how you could think of like a science STEM event or workshop. Um, we also do informational sessions with the local fire departments. We've um, done a few municipality projects and put solar at the fire departments themselves and it really spurred a lot of interest in them when they know the details of the project. So we would offer that to the local fire department. Um, you know, through the Illinois pro, uh, programs, those rec programs, there's some opportunity to pull in local job force. And then I do show it actually in the next slide, there's an option to add a public kiosk in URL to show the um, performance of the array. And that right here, you know, it's just an example, but that is, it could become a little bit tailored to what impacts you're showing, but that's something that your patrons can see, the community can see coming into your lobby or having on your website. Um, and then like I said, it's about 94% of the library's electricity usage, which is equivalent to 60 metric tons of CO2 or nearly 150,000 miles driven by a passenger vehicle, and that's just each year. Um, final step here is just questions, and really I kind of outlined a lot of times the questions are, you know, what are some of the next steps to take, and those would be actual utility bill analysis, you know, site visits, going through some preliminary design, cost-benefit iterations, and then providing recommendations on specific equipment, key components, and compiling and submitting interconnection and adjustable block program applications. Okay, all right, does, does that wind it up there? I don't wanna cut you off. No, that winds it up. Um, okay. So would you prefer me to stop sharing so you could see everybody and then I- Yeah, I that would actually something. help a little bit, thank you. Okay, yeah, no problem. Okay, great, great. So I'll, I'll just start it off and then I'm going to look around. Oh, wait, Omer, I see you have your hand up already. Go ahead. Go ahead, Omer. Hi, sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, thanks for your presentation. I had a question. What uh, company do you use for your solar panels and what are the efficiencies of those panels? I can let Josh jump in if he wants to talk about specific efficiencies, but we we do work with a few different panel providers because um, there's a lot of market and policy dynamics that can go on. So we want to get the best quality at the best price we can um, okay. for you. We um, work with some U.S. manufactured and some Indian manufactured panels primarily. Who are those manufacturers? Um, Jinko would be one. Okay. Vikram, um, what Brian, Adani, Wari, um, LG for the U, LG I think is the only U.S. panel we've used. We use that. We've done a, a handful of National Guard projects and we use LG there. And what are the, what are the efficiencies ballpark range? And jump in, it's typically around 20% or so depending on manufacturer and model and whatnot. Okay. Um, and then what's the cost total for, uh, you know, per, 
per kilowatt or whatever, or per watt for the installation, like ballpark. Again, I know you're looking at different types of panels and stuff, but. Is, is any, is someone from your group gonna answer that? Sorry, I think Brian was muted. I think he started. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I, it, honestly, it, it is hard to put a dollar on a kilowatt because every project's so different. Um, you know, on a you know on a a roof mount um, project of this size, uh, you're probably and it could range in depending on the structural and all that. It, it could range in the two fifty to three fifty for the full. Uh, okay. Hundred thousand for a full full project size. I mean, it, but we could we could easily you know once we spent more time and understood the structural, understood um, you know the materials and whatnot, it would it would be wouldn't take much time to nail down nail down a cost. So, what I mean, just would you tell me what is it that you were just talking about the dollar amount, the full dollar amount of the project? Right. Two hundred fifty thousand to three hundred thousand. Is that what you're saying? The two fifty to three fifty. Yeah, that's a that's a preliminary, a rough guess. But we're also, um, you know, are we talking about the same thing here? I, I just want to make sure I understand your what how you're couching your estimate. Well, it's it's not an estimate. I mean, it's 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 a it's a kind of swag number that I'm just saying based on some previous projects of a similar size. The cost would be around two hundred fifty thousand to three fifty thousand, probably in that range. Okay. And, and I know that's a big range, but we, we, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. Obviously, we we haven't spent time okay. in the building looking at the electrical, looking at the structural, and all that good stuff. So, right. Um, actually, I don't want to cut you off, Amir. I just wanted to clarify what he was saying. Were, were you done, or oh, did you have another question? That's exactly what I was asking. Okay. All right. And, and to clarify, Karen. I mean, that's turnkey so that's not just the equipment cost right that's all the design engineering um and execute yeah. the project and i guess that well, doesn't take into account a lot of the incentives right i'm sorry taking what jen the incentives that you were mentioning you know tax credits and all that it's not yet yeah, taking that into account you're saying right you're at the top level Correct. well that's a so that's a gross amount mm -hmm. not not net of any grants or Right. Credits or anything. Um, okay, so like I see, your fee is on uh, it's on page one thirty six of our packet. Uh, it looks like total fee of fifty five thousand, and that would be in addition to the amount you just gave us, or would that be included within it? I know that was a very big ballpark figure you gave us, but I'm, I'm, we're just trying to get a little bit of a handle on how much this is going to cost. Brian, I think that would want to take this one. So that was specific to the solar, um, I'll call it construction costs, the engineering and construction costs associated with the solar. Um, okay. All right. And and uh, did I understand you to be? And I don't want to misquote you, but are are you suggesting a ballasted approach as opposed to bolting down the panels? Is that correct? Uh, again, that that would that would likely be it. Likely be a majority ballasted. There may be, depending on the, um, depending on the engineering doc uh, review, it could require some anchors, but it'd be majority ballast likely, and the structure. Okay, all right. So I'm going to look around uh, right now at the other board members. I see Diane, you have your hand just up. You want to ask a question? Just, to be clear, just on the construction cost. So that was, that would be construction cost only is what I was referring to. So if we, if we installation cost, so. It would be installation cost. So you're saying that wouldn't include the panels themselves? Is that, is that what you're telling yeah, me? Material and installation, correct. Not it would include not materials. Correct. I'm not sure. I think, yeah, I think it's getting late. We're all kind of talking in circles a little bit. I, I think what Brian's saying is if the project, you know, is a go and is 
awarded. This includes final engineering, interconnection applications, any of these grant applications, the procurement of materials, and the labor for installation and execution. Okay. 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 It's, right. a, it's a turnkey service. I don't think that was the number shared in this um, a, a original response you've got, right? No, no, uh -uh. it's not in there. Okay. All right. Um, actually, Diane, you were trying to ask a question. Do you want um, to go ahead? Yeah. So, so the 55,000 is for the project scope as explained in your documents, right? Yes, that's correct. So that, so what that, that is for. Does that include any structural analysis? I didn't get that. I, I didn't see that. Yes. So the, so what that, fit, that 55,000 includes is that includes all of your electric, um, the solar, the so I'll call it the solar engineering, the structural engineering, um, site visits to make analysis, get you guys to uh, submit uh, plans for permits, um, get, get through uh, any of that sort of stuff. The regular, the creating the blueprints, the construction documents. That's what that's called. Okay, thank you. Uh, another, another question. I really appreciated your um, beginning of your uh, documents um, where you indicated that um, uh, something about local fire departments needing to be familiar with solar equipment. I mean, is that something that you, <laughs> I don't understand what that meant. Oh, Diane, no, I, I, yeah. Um, Diane, I was just showing the versatility of the community engagement and education we would do. Um, Okay. The fire, the fire right. department does not need to be all the the project will be designed to fire code, and the authority having jurisdiction will approve it. But often the fire department gets interested in it, and it's more of an interest okay. than added bonus. But the project will be designed to fire code and and all that. Okay. Here's another question. Uh, you also under education. Um, indicated that solar energy is a technology that is a growth that is growing exponentially does that mean that what we buy 10 years from now will be obsolete um no i think that means um if you look at some reports across the country or the the globe like the amount of it's growing so much they measured gigawatts being installed so I don't think it's saying that the technology will be outdated. It's just that more and more people are installing solar. Um, oh. what, what I think you'll see coming down the line in the next 10, 20 years is storage options. And those can, um, projects can be rehabbed to have storage added. But as I mentioned, ComEd has net metering, they'll do the storage for you. So it's really a great program to take advantage of the utility storing, storing it and sending it back. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, Anyone? other questions from other uh, members of the board? All right, um, I, I don't see any right now. So um, unless there's any other, anything else you would like to add? I mean, we, well, we can I ask our... one more thing? I'm sure, sorry, man. can I ask one more? Sure. I, I mean, we don't live in a warm climate, certainly not sunny around here all winter. So I know that we're going to use our stored energy, but do you, do you know of any experiences where people, where companies or buildings that you have installed solar power? Um, and they just run out of their power and they're ending up paying more than they would have before. Um, no, I, I would say, I guess I'm not sharing my screen anymore. That, that generation I shared for the two different system sizes, when Josh on our team puts together designs, he accounts for, um, I mean, really the, exactly where you're at um, 
in the world. So that's come for for hours of sunlight. And it uses local historical weather data, uh, most likely, but it's often at an airport that has the 20 or 50 year historical weather. And then we also have an option to put in um, the impact of snow being on the roof, right? So when you're seeing that 85,000, it's net or very specific to this address. Uh, and of course, okay. at certain time, I mean, and again, we don't, we don't target that 100% because if you have efficiency come in place, now you've paid for a system that's larger, or if you're in a PPA, you're paying for more production than you're using. So you will always probably have a small balance from your utility, but you're going to net out paying less. And that's, um, I mean, that's part of going through this, that the design the team's going to deliver is going to have that cost-benefit analysis. That what you're paying, regardless of the procurement method, what you're paying is um, operation cost post solar is going to be net less than pre solar. Did that help, Diane? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, are there any other questions from the uh, board members? Okay, I don't see any right now. So I want to thank you all uh, for joining us this evening and for going through the proposals, answering the questions that we have. Uh, it's still a lot for us to digest. So we're going to be talking about this future uh, in throughout the future here, uh, but we'll get back to you about this uh, through our administrators. So again, thank you um, and enjoy what's left of your evening. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. the board members, I'm going to ask you to. Uh, stay on the line here for a little bit. Well, not too much longer, don't worry. And okay, and thank I you all. Thank you. I know, thank Karen, you. you have um, David's information and any specific questions you can pass through to us and, and we can help. Okay. Well. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, all right, it's about a quarter to 10, and uh, I don't know about you, but I'm sort of uh, tired of staring at a Zoom screen, which I was already doing a bit earlier today. Um, so we have a couple, yeah. you know, several things that's on the agenda, and I just want to talk about what, first of all, what we want to, how much longer we want to go tonight. Uh, you know, we have discussion, possible roof action, public comment, I think we do need to do public comment and adjournment. Uh, well, why don't we do public comment right now, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Do we have some uh, Tisha here? Hello, Tisha. Can Hi. you hear us? Hi there. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Super. Uh, Welcome to the public comment section. Thank you. Okay, um, you, you should have received recently an email regarding uh, Constellation Solar Company, and I would like the library to uh, select them to provide solar energy to the library. This would eliminate the need for a roof replacement in order to handle the installation of solar panels, which also would not be needed and would save taxpayer immense, payers immensely. The cost for their, these services, this service would be saving energy costs for the library. Was that clear? So, <laughs> I'm tired uh, too. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're, you're recommending we look into Constellation Solar Company? Is, is that what I heard you say? Yes. Did you get an email about, uh, about yes. the, Linda did? Okay. Yes. From uh, Ms. McCoola, I believe. Yes. Okay, good. All right, perfect. Oh, oh okay, yes, yes. yes. It looked like a clipboard that was a, it was a picture of a clipboard, that email? Yes. Is that what we're talking about? Oh, okay, yes. okay, fine, I did And that. I did, I did uh, research that company. I called and they, um, you know, because it was sent out to the residents, but they do obviously do businesses as well. So uh, please consider them in your journey to your decision. <laughs> okay, all okay. right. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway. All right. Very Thanks informational very three hours. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good okay. night. All right. Good, good night. Good night. Thank you. Um, okay, fine. So I, first thing I just want to ask the board is, uh, do you want it? Well, okay, we, we have a little bit more information by Greg, who has submitted the information on page 139 to 140 something. Uh, we could go through just that. We could continue to discuss it. We could just say, okay, I've had it for tonight. Um, what, what would, what's your pleasure? Just let me know. I think it Adjourn. Depends on what we have on the schedule for next week. Do we have time to add more things in next week? There's very little on this schedule for, for on this agenda. So yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? You were freezing there up. Is, there is very little um, on the agenda for this coming uh, board meeting. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, any other? Uh, yes, Carolyn. Carolyn, but you got to take your mood, mute off. Carolyn, Carolyn can't hear you. Um, just real quick, um, we need to wait for the um, dollar amount for the tower, correct, which should possibly be coming next week. So that would help complete that aspect of it. And then can we just, you know, finalize this next week? I'm dead. I I just feel like I can't. I understand. I understand. That's why I'm asking people. So yeah. Oh, Okay, I got a motion second. to adjourn, and I got a second, <laughs> and uh, Thank you. all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, save your packets, all right? Yes, okay. yes. We'll talk about it more next, thank you. next week. Uh, and thank Thanks. you, Greg and Susan. I know it's been a long night for you, too. And, yes, uh, thank you, guys. Good night. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Good night. Thanks, Good night. Good night. Good night.